By the way, listener, it is a problem in our world right now that we might run out of helium. Not soon. What do you mean? But we will, well, because... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That took me way Sorry. too long. <laughs> I'm Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratchett, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast. Each month we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month we're talking about The Long War, or The Longest Journey to Finding Out the Title is Pretty Much Wrong. <laughs> and our guest is writer and editor, Diane Sheldon Collins. Welcome, Diane. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, look, it's such a pleasure. You are you're a Terry Pratchett fan. Yes. But did you get into Terry Pratchett the usual way through the Discworld? Yes, I did. Um, it was, one might say, a little bit of a uh, long journey for me because <laughs> Appropriate, <laughs> you see what I did yes. there. Uh, wasn't a long war, though, for, for what it's worth. Um, Neither was this book. <laughs> when I was in year eight, I think we studied the amazing Maurice and his educated rodents at school. And I enjoyed it, but that wasn't like my, you know, Terry Pratchett awakening moment. Like I liked it and then I kind of went away for a few years. And then when I was at uni, some friends who were really into kind of Terry Pratchett's, you know, broader oeuvre put me onto the disc world just in general. And I was like, oh yeah, I think I read like one of those books back when I was like 13 or something. And we were at a secondhand bookstore and they had the color of magic and I was like okay apparently this is the first in the series so I will uh, I'll buy this one because I like to read things in chronological order <laughs> uh, as you can tell I didn't know a lot about Pratchett at the time you don't really need to start with that one to uh, get to know the disc world but yeah I read it and I remember the first few chapters like I laughed a few times but I hadn't quite gotten that sense of his humor yet like I didn't really get it get it and I remember messaging one of my friends like at the train station after we'd parted ways going oh there was a joke about a big bang that was really funny haha I like Terry Pratchett and then I actually like sat down and read the book properly and began to realize just that it was this amazing kind of loving satire of this swords and sorcery genre that I was already a huge fan of and I love satire and I love fantasy and so it was kind of like that was my revelation of oh this is what Pratchett's doing this really interesting commentary on things and it's also one of his own only books I think that like really ends on like a literal cliffhanger <laughs> or in this case a world hanger um spoiler alert I guess for any listeners <laughs> and I like ran out and bought the light fantastic because I wanted to know what happened next but then those two were kind of that duology and when I finished those I was like okay I'll go on to equal rights and more I'll read them in order and I enjoyed those, but after I'd read about four, I was like, oh, you really don't need to read these books in any particular order, like, or at least not the way that I'm doing it. <laughs> so after that, it just kind of became this erratic thing of like, if I found a Pratchett book that looked interesting, I'd read it. And it was, yeah, my favorite to this day is Going Postal, which I just yes. kind of, yes, oh my God. I Excellent just, choice. I, yes, it's, it's the classic. I think it's a, a lot of people's favorites for very good reason. I think that was Pratchett at his peak. And so I've never found another one that got me quite the same way Going Postal has, but but I do remember have very fond memories of like getting to know Rinse Wind and all that kind of like wacky early Pratchett in the Color of Magic. Yeah, obviously we haven't got you in today to talk about a Discworld <laughs> yeah. book. Uh, did you have you read any of his non-Discworld stuff before this? I haven't. No. And um, when I when I got the email, I was simultaneously like, "Oh, they want me on Pratchett. That's so exciting! Oh my god, it's one of those ones." <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's it's a, it's a type of Pratchett that I wouldn't normally approach. Like I'd heard mixed things about it, but the actual reading of it was, it was a little bit like homework, if I'm honest, because I was <laughs> reading it for a purpose. I was reading it with a deadline. I was like, I, I have to have this done by the day of the recording. I'm going to force myself through it, even if I don't like it. And I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I expected to. So I sound like I'm being negative, but I actually, um, I'm glad we're chatting about it because I think it's a really interesting read. Um, but mm. yeah, it's not my usual choice of Pratchett. Um, and Baxter, I actually haven't read any of his standalone novels. So I'm a newcomer to Baxter. 
Mm. No, I'm absolutely with you on that. Like, I've not read any Baxter other than these, and I don't know if I ever would have read them if we weren't doing mm. the podcast because it's not something that would have appealed to me. I'm glad that we are reading them because I actually have found once I'm they're forced to do it that I'm like oh actually these are these are good like and there's like <laughs> yeah. some really good stuff in here that I'm glad I'm reading but it is not something I would have come to on my own I'm pretty sure and that's one of the joys of a podcast like this I think is that you do approach those things you wouldn't necessarily I found similar experiences when I was a book reviewer um, for Orealis I would sometimes read books that I would never have approached normally I was just reading them for the reviewing and I actually discovered some really great sci-fi and fantasy that way hmm and it, you, you're a big sci-fi fantasy reader. I mean, we know of you through the uh, <laughs> Speculate Science yeah. Fiction Convention. Well, how would we? What would we describe it? I can't remember what it's, uh, best time book, ever. How <laughs> yeah, I, would describe I mean, it. that's Lisa's got yeah. it. Lisa's got the tagline right there. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> Speculate is essentially it's kind of a marrying of a science fiction convention and a writers festival because the focus mm. is that it's a sci-fi fantasy horror event, but for writers more than sort of readers and consumers. Obviously, readers are very welcome there, but it's it's a writer's festival. Um, it's sort mm. of first and foremost, I think. Um, but yeah, it's a couple of days of, well, we had two festivals uh, and then went on hiatus. And then in our hiatus year, 2020 happened. So we kind of ended up on hiatus from our hiatus. Um, but there are some interesting developments happening at Speculate uh, in the near future. So that's exciting. Stay tuned, folks, particularly if you're in Melbourne, but maybe anywhere. Who knows yeah. what form <laughs> festivals will take in the future. Uh, but you're pretty well read in terms of fantasy and sci-fi. Is this kind of thing your kind of deal in that realm? Not usually. I think I'm one of those sci-fi fan- Well, spec fic, I keep sort of using it interchangeably with sci-fi and fantasy, but obviously the speculative mm. fiction umbrella covers a lot of genres and subgenres. Um, but I've always been kind of that fantasy fan who likes the idea of science fiction, but hasn't found that much sci-fi that really spoke to me personally. And I don't think that that's like, that's not a criticism of sci-fi as a genre. It's just that the things that I look for in what I read and engage with are often not the sort of the priority areas of science fiction like I often I think one of the reasons I enjoy fantasy um, a lot more is that um, sort of a lot of the iconic fantasy stories that I enjoy they're very world building heavy but they're also quite character driven whereas sci-fi is often more about like the big ideas the science the world building is often more technical obviously I'm generalizing and a lot of hard sci-fi is actually very driven by emotion and characters but just the genre kind of in a general way often I find it harder to connect with characters so um, something like this was really interesting for me because it was an author who is best known for fantasy coming together with an author who is best known I think for sci-fi and writing something that I think on the surface it looks like hard sci-fi I was expecting it to be very much like a kind of space opera and in reality sort of reads almost more like fantasy in some ways I felt hmm. Hmm. yeah I think I think this is typical of a lot of Pratchett's work is that even when he's dealing with the tropes of one genre, he might feel a bit like something else. Like I often feel like a lot of the Discworld reads in some ways a bit more like, I mean, fairly loose sci-fi, but it's got that more sort of holding a mirror up to the real world kind of attitude that I think good sci-fi often has. Yeah. But then he's doing it through this fantasy lens rather than a science fiction lens. And I think this book is, uh, and the series so far, I mean, I've only read the first two, but I feel, yeah, I agree with you. Um, although knowing that um, the next two books are The Long Mars and The Long Cosmos, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. well, maybe it's going to get more space opera. I don't know. I don't know. But the we... Long War was not nearly as confrontational as I was expecting it to well, be. Well, <laughs> yes, true. Yeah. But it was a long book. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that true. in. Just the, the way that Liz said it encapsulated a lot of feelings, I think. <laughs> But we should discuss the book at hand, and we like to kick off our discussion of the book with a reading of the blurb. The long earth is open. Humanity has spread across untold worlds linked by fleets of airships encouraging exploration, trade, and culture. But while mankind may be shaping the long earth, the long earth is, in turn, shaping mankind, and a collision of crises is looming. More than a million steps from the original earth, a new America is emerging a young nation that resents answering to the Datum government. And the trolls, those graceful hive-mind humanoids whose song once suffused the long earth, are, in the face of man's inexorable advance, beginning to fall silent and to disappear. 
It was Joshua Valiente who, with the omniscient being known as Lobsang, first explored these multiple worlds. And it is to Joshua that the long earth turns for help. For there is the very real threat of war. A war unlike any fought before. Really does talk up the war, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> what war? Uh, well, I mean, they. I know there's it, like stuff. It is but... unlike any war fought before. I think we can say that is true. <laughs> I think your tone reading out the long war was more confrontational than the actual mm. war in the book. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, yeah no, that was a compliment abilities. to your dramatic reading. It was very effective. Thank you. And look, just for any listeners who may have missed this, this is the second book in a series. So if you haven't listened to it or read the book, you might want to go back to Pratchett 31 and listen to that first before we get into this. But this is the sequel to The Long Earth. Yes, it's good if you've read the previous book, but I also think if you want to jump straight into this one, all you really need to know is there was an invention made that caused people to be able to step sideways into other parallel versions of our Earth, and it seems like there's infinite ones in two different directions. And... Basically, if you have that knowledge, I reckon you could jump into this book. You might not know the characters as well, but I, I reckon you could still get a lot out of this. I can attest as someone who started with this book rather than Long Earth, um, I'm going to just admit that on record, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. that it actually, I was able to follow it a lot more than I thought I would. I started reading it and said to myself, if I don't understand what's happening, I'll go back and read The Long Earth first. And it, it took a little bit of paying attention for the first few chapters to figure out what they were talking about, but it's actually, it's quite standalone and self-explanatory in the way the premise works. The main things that I had to work to get my head around was just kind of the character content like who these people were and what the history was between them. And I gather from what I now know about The Long Earth that some of those relationships weren't even necessarily established in the first book anyway. Some of them actually came with this book. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there are characters, and we'll get to a few specific examples, I'm sure, but there are characters in this book who are quite major characters here who were in The Long Earth but were literally mentioned in one sentence. <laughs> like, it's... It's quite an amazing... I have a feeling like the two of them must have sat down and planned out all of these books all together, like who was going to be important in what book. And then when they were writing the first one, they were just like, oh, this guy's not going to show up till the next one, but let's just mention him here. Hmm. And you're like, what? This is weird. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of that. But you don't really need to know because because that is the case. They have to establish who these people are and what the relationship is in this book. They can't rely on your remembering but then every now and then there is something in this book where you're like oh if you've read the previous book but it's been a while like for us where it's been like more than a year uh then it's like um wait i'm sure i remember this and i think that's probably worse than not having read the previous <laughs> yeah. book to yeah. tell the truth I, I nearly cracked the shits like when i started it and they were just like and then this new character and then this character and this is happening here and now we're in another place and i was like is the whole book going to be like this am i going to just spend the whole time being like <sighs> <laughs> yeah, was that, but, that was like chapter one or two. There was just like this two page sequence that was about like five scene breaks across five paragraphs. And I was like, is, am I going to have to keep track of all of these people? <laughs> yeah. Need a map. And the answer is kind of, but not all of mm. them. I mean, look, we won't, as we found it with the first book, because there's so much going on, we're not going to be able to go into all the intricacies of the entire plot. But I think it is important to sort of set everything up by going through the sort of start in a little more detail. One of the other things that's interesting about this is that it is a sequel, but it picks up 10 years later. And the first book ends with uh, someone who can't step, who's been left behind by his family, who's been kind of taken advantage of by a fairly, basically a far right organization who objects to all these people who can step leaving the earth. Uh, but he's been manipulated by them into detonating a nuclear bomb in Madison, which is the town where our main protagonist, Joshua Valiente, is from. It's where the guy was living who released the instructions on how to build stepper boxes. It's kind of like the central place. Uh, and even in this book, there's a lot of stuff that happens in Madison, or rather because the original one was blown up with a nuclear bomb in the stepwise versions of it. So the, the world's next door. And... That was kind of the the climax of the previous book was this horrific, like, September 11 kind of scene of people uh, stepping sideways to avoid being blown up by the bomb and some of them doing it even though they're on the, like, 12th floor of a high-rise building because they might survive that fall, but they're definitely not going to survive being next to ground zero of a nuclear bomb. So it was like, wow, really, like, high-stakes, awful stuff. And then this book's 10 years later and we don't really deal 
with, um, and I hesitate to use the term, the fallout of that event. I see um, what you did there. I didn't it's... mean to do it. I saw it coming and I was upset with myself. But um, this is just, yeah, you can't stop it. No. <laughs> but um, they concentrate all the sadness of that into one character, basically. Mm-hmm. Like they just put all of the fallout into her. And it's a character that you do meet in the previous books that it is sad to have, like, because basically, like, to cut to the chase, she is now sick with cancer because she was mm-hmm. exposed to the radiation from going back and forth from and the this site. Is... This is Monica Spooky Jansen, one of my favorite characters from The Long Earth. She's like one of the first cops on the scene figuring out what to do about Step Day and indeed uh, met Joshua on that day when he first stepped sideways. And she's our first character in the book watching this viral video uh, of these guys in spacesuits trying to take this baby from a troll who's one of these non-human humanoids who can step as well. And I love that she got reintroduced so early. Um, and then I was kind of disappointed that she doesn't come back until quite a bit further into the book. You know, there's a lot of stuff introduced in this first chapter that comes back later. I don't know. I I felt really kind of, really, we're not going to deal with what happened, like a nuclear bomb in an American town. Like, and I, I kind of feel like the political and cultural aftermath of that is not really touched on very much in this book. And I feel like they, surely there must be more of that. But I guess that's, you know, that's. If I want to know more, I should write some fan fiction. I, guess. <laughs> I feel like skipping to like ten years later or whatnot, and seeing how like like that scene where Joshua and his family comes back, and it's it's all just really militaristic, and they make them jump through all these hoops and all that. It's you see like the the way it's been politicized and the end result of it, rather than the human <laughs> suffering. Like immediately afterwards, you see how like that's been turned into a political end to make society a bit uglier. And I Mm. thought that was an interesting way to go about it because I guess, like, we could all sit down and imagine what the fallout would be. Like, we we can see how it would be for individuals, for society. Like, that's something we can do on our own. But these authors, I think, were showing us their version of how the politics would play out. And so maybe it's kind of nice to be given the credit that we can fill in the gaps ourselves. That's a really, I think that's a really interesting point, Liz. And that made me realize as well that if we are drawing those 9-11 comparisons, this book was probably written 10 years after 9-11 happened. Like it was published 2013. They were probably writing it around 2011, 2012. So they were probably writing it from themselves a place of 10 years on from a disaster like that, looking Mm. at the kind of political landscape of that sort of long-term consequence. Mm. Yeah, but it still it was still a bit of a shock, I think, coming to this sequel and realizing that oh, we're not picking off from what I thought was kind of a massive cliffhanger. Oh okay. yeah, I, I I'm really curious as well because I agree with you. I think that that's um, it's a I, I was going to now I'm doing it. It's an explosive ending to the book. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just going to lean into it. It's an explosive ending to the book, and uh, you would expect it to take up, um, if not exactly where it left off, then still in that immediate um, aftermath. And I'm really curious about where book three is going to start after that Yellowstone ending. Like, are they going to do Mm. the same thing um, for, you know, ending this book on a really climatic, earth-changing, or in this case, sort of multi-earth-changing event? Or are they going to go into another time leap or different focus? And if they do do that, I think the context will be different as well, because as you pointed out, this was a you know political domestic terror attack as opposed to a natural disaster. So the mm. you know the fallout from that would probably be different. But also, we've seen even in this book the glimpses of people sort of politicizing that natural disaster and saying you know this is a sign of the end of times because of the people who are leaving humanity and that kind of thing. So mm. I I am curious to see um, how they will approach that in the third book yeah it's the year 4000 all the characters you spent a whole 540 pages learning about are dead welcome to 50 new characters no no there was that one fish in chapter 10 of the log war who's now a main character (laughs) um yes look it could happen it could happen um but look let's let's look at what they are concerned with as this novel opens because spooky jensen who i'm gonna call spooky even though it only comes up once or twice but just because i like her and i love her nickname uh, she's retired. As you say, she's sick because she's lived near Madison 
She's living in Madison West 5. And just as a recap for listeners, if you haven't read the book for a while, they refer to the directions in which you can step as east and west. But these are just arbitrary labels for the two directions in which you can go. But maybe there's more. But they yeah. do talk, yes. Well, they we will come back to that. Uh, but they do say uh, they they do make a big point that because those are the labels that have been chosen for for cultural reasons, people in America particularly choose to step west, uh, and people in in China in this book uh, choose to step east. Um, but you could go either way. Uh, but yes. Uh, but she's living there. She's been living next door, but she hasn't been able to stop going back to the datum version of Madison where she was a police officer trying to help people out and figure out what's going on. And that's meant she's had too much exposure to the radiation there and she's now got leukemia. But she's watching a video as it opens, uh, as I was talking about earlier, of these two guys in spacesuits trying to take this troll's baby. And the troll's called Mary. And she refuses to let them take her baby. And there's quite a graphic description of how in the video she snaps this sort of cattle prod that they're trying to jab her with in half and then jams half of it into this guy's eye. <laughs> like, it's a weird moment where it's like, okay, I can see how people's opinions of this are going to be polarized in terms of people in the world. But I think Pratchett and Baxter are writing it pretty firmly in the camp of these guys are jerks. <laughs> like, they got what was coming to them. And interestingly, you know, there's a lot of... um there's a lot there's a lot in this like it really sets up a lot of stuff about the trolls for example Mary's able to sign quite emphatically I will not which becomes quite a thing later in the book and she's watching it going okay well this is this is not great and it's kind of the it's described several times as being like the tip of the iceberg as to what's going on with human troll relations so that's one thing that's happening in the first chapter we also meet Two other non-humans who will not return in the book until much, much later. I'd forgotten them. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them, uh, one of them is described, well, they're given, they're given names by humans to make sense of them. Uh, so there's one who's described as a kobold, who's, uh, sort of another weird sort of offshoot of the lineage of, of humans. And then the other one is a beagle who's wearing a gold ring with sapphire set in it, which is significant. And having read the first book, I immediately kind of knew what that was and had some ideas about what it might mean. And I'm I'm very smug that I was more or less sort of right, not entirely, <laughs> but I was very happy about that. You should be. There's a lot in that book. There is, yeah. But uh, they're basically discussing that the trolls are not happy about what humans are doing to them and they don't like humans either and they're going to push them back where they came from, which sounds pretty rough and dangerous. And you're like, okay, this is not ideal. I kind of get it though because like, the glimpses you get of how people are acting, you're like, yeah, you're just making a mess of everyone yeah. else's world. But yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and being rude and mean. Humans going somewhere and ruining it for everyone is... It's just a theme of history. I mean, because this is the interesting thing, right, is that one of the weird aspects of this series is the choice to have this infinite number of parallel worlds, but none of them are inhabited. Like, the only one that has humans is the Datum Earth, like the one where humans started out. And so when they go out into the Long Earth, it's just it's empty of people. Um, you know, it's still got trees and animals and stuff. But then as you go further out, you do find these other humanoids and intelligent life forms and so there's still there are still people for humans to mistreat. They, there's only a few times where they really make a direct analogy of colonization and the way that, you know, particularly Europeans would treat indigenous populations as they traveled around the world. Well, they quite literally had like a sugar plantation scene, though, that was like really like unambiguous. Yes, during one that's of the, true. Yeah, they were literally on a plantation for sugar and it was horrible. But um, this is a really good way of exploring human nature having all of these different like because you can basically just set up a whole bunch of different societies and see how different groups of people would fail or succeed or thrive or just pick on different bits of human nature and i found it really interesting seeing that mostly it's regressing there's the whole thing about how technology on like basic society level has not improved because there's no competition no impetus no drive to do better the technology for moving between worlds, of course, that has improved because there's a desire for that and a business for that. And it's also been given, like the technology has been given away for free. But one of the things I found really fascinating was all the little like pioneer societies. So like, there's a character that we meet in the previous book who becomes more significant in this one, Helen, who is one of the first, like her family is one of the first ones to trek out and create a new sort of like 
build from scratch pioneer society thing and she would have like because the last book set in like 2015 or whatever so she's kind of like a contemporary of ours kind of thing and so her parents go out build a new society called reboot and by 18 19 she's married to some much older guy and immediately having kids and stuff which is like this is not a criticism of things this is but it's just it's amazing how like like that's going back to an older time kind of thing like it was like okay, we build all our own stuff. And her, her dad's like, well, now that you're 16, you need to like go off and find a use for yourself. And she's like, maybe midwifery, et cetera. And so I guess like this is my really inelegant way of segueing into a topic that really stood out for me, which is like Joshua Valiente, the protagonist of uh, arguably this book and the previous one, ends up married to Helen. And I hated their relationship and how it was depicted. Like, I didn't hate that they were together. They seemed like a nice couple. But the way that it was described in the book, they kept calling her his young wife. And I was kind of like, why are you so, like, keen on underscoring that? I'm sorry if I'm, like, going on a weird tirade about this. Like, I'm not – it's not about their age difference. It was about the focus on the fact that he's, like, snagged himself, this young wife. And – then her whole character basically is defined by this weird rivalry she has with his friend who he's never had a romantic Mm. relationship with and who she hates for no reason other than she knows Joshua and sometimes takes him away. Like it's, I really didn't because I liked her in the previous book and she had a lot of potential and I just feel like that she was turned into a scold here. She was just turned into his young wife who gave him a son and just complains when he goes away. And it's kind of like, you know, every U S sitcom. No, I, I don't think you're tirading there. I think that's actually a really valid point because, um, one of the things that really struck me when I started the book as well, as you were saying, was this, uh, focus on the pioneering, also that pioneering aesthetic. Like I could tell that there was an American writer behind parts of this book because there was kind of this, interesting romanticized view of like the kind of pilgrim pioneer lifestyle and the way they're like living in the log cabins and creating a society on you know new land full of promise and I like I'm not necessarily against that aesthetic or that idea I think it's an interesting one but I it felt it made the first parts of the book feel almost more historical than futuristic because there was this focus on this kind of old world living and to some extent I think it was kind of romanticized and glorified in other ways I think it was interrogated Um, but I think that Helen very much did come into that and the way she almost became kind of the um, this, the, the novel symbol of that way of life, the way that she was treated by the narrative and by the characters. She was this little woman to the famous man, stands in the shadows, raising his son, wanting to like hold him down to the hearth when he is an adventurer kind of thing. And, um, there were aspects, as you say, of their relationship that I did really like. And I thought that they were in many ways quite a nice couple, but the representation of their relationship and the way that it fit in with the other themes of the book was, uh interesting <laughs> yeah yeah and i thought it was like because i i agree 100 percent, but i also didn't like the way that sally's attitude mm. is portrayed mm. because she also has this utter disdain for helen like there's a bit uh it was one of the quotes that i wrote down she describes her as a gloomy little stay at home mm. and even joshua is depicted as thinking of sally as Helen's enigmatic rival. Like, the the three of them are written as if it's just a given that if a married man has uh, a history with a, another woman, even just as a friend, if it's significant, that those two women cannot get along. And it just, yeah, really... It shat me. <laughs> I yeah, hated really that aspect of the book. Having read that as well as someone who hadn't read The Long Earth first, because when I was trying to get a handle on these characters and their relationships, coming to it totally cold, I assumed that they were exes, that they weren't together, that Sally and Joshua, I mean, like that they weren't together now mm. because he was happy with Helen. But the way that that relationship was written, even within the book, without having that broader context, I assumed that Sally was like some old love of Joshua's who they'd reached a point of being friends, but there was always going to be that history between them so so it was really interesting to me to realize that they actually there never was anything like that going on between them that's just the mythos around them and even they seem to be buying into it yeah i just want to say though i don't blame you that you think stephen baxter must be american 
but he's not. He's, he's English. Not? Oh, my God. And this is the thing that blew my mind reading the first book as well because it is so US-centric. Yeah. Nearly all the main characters are from America. Most of the action happens in America. It's all about the American reaction. I mean, in this book we see a little bit of Australia, which is, is kind of nice, but, I mean, and weird, like uh, one of the contradictory bits of the book as well. So that was kind of weird. But, you know, that was fun from someone who lives in Australia, but then, and a little bit of the UK, but not really. Uh, and in the first book, they're quite disdainful of the UK. Like they hardly say anything about it, except that basically they, they're the fuck ups of step day, right? Like the UK economy <laughs> collapses. They're no good. They can't do anything. I thought it was quite interesting. And I'm sure I thought this when we were reading the first book, they talk about the fact that, you know, the whole resource industry, basically the bottom falls out of it because there's so much gold and silver and wood and iron, like there's so much of this stuff available that none of it's worth anything anymore, which basically would overnight tank the Australian economy. Yeah. So, uh, but that doesn't, there's no repercussions of that. It's not really talked about. So they, they're not writing, it's not like they've researched every country in the world and, and sort of figured out what would happen there. For some reason, they've just decided to really focus on the US. And I, I don't know if that's just from a Western bias of what we want to talk about, one of the superpowers. I didn't like that it was so USA centric. I was wondering if I was missing out on a full experience because I don't have the nostalgia, the connections or understand the significance of this place or that place. I can't draw those sort of lines back. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of USA as being traditionally very patriotic, um, as opposed to say the UK or Australia, that paid off in terms of their whole driving thing of we have to go bring the people home. We got to let them know that this is the USA and no matter what you're all part. And I say this as a non-American who does not, I, I could be wrong about this, but I feel like perhaps that was one of the the drives if they wanted to set it in, like pr- primarily in the USA to yeah. make it that whole because that is one of the big things in the book. This book, yeah, and the way that the plight of the Long Earth colonists in the Aegis of the US, which is what they call the footprint, so basically the version of America that exists on all these other worlds, the way that that echoes the experience of well European settlers in America particularly people who lived in the English colonies there who during this later on the the stepwise colonies of America, a lot of them sort of gather together and try to do their own declaration of independence because just like the Americans were pissed off at not having any representation in uh, the UK parliament and yet still having to pay taxes, we see it again here. The people who've gone out into the long earth are like, you want us to pay taxes, you want to freeze our assets if we've gone too far away but you expect us to obey by your laws and do your thing. No, we don't want to do that. And you're like, okay, well, so that it's certainly that aspect of it. But I also think they picked that story to tell. And it's hard to know if they decided they wanted to set it in America and then that's the story that sort of rose from that or if that's the story they wanted to tell and America was the natural place to tell it. So I don't know which way it went. I did feel like this was a very US-centric book, as we've been saying. And one of the things that struck me throughout this book as I was reading it, I think that this book has a very confused relationship with colonization. I think Mm. that it simultaneously recognizes many of the issues with that and wants to highlight them, but also doesn't necessarily have the... I guess the, I don't know, I just feel like it makes some cursory attempts to interrogate it, but in a lot of ways it kind of just uh, brushes it to the side. And it's not alone in that. I think that a lot of um, science fiction, um, you know, particularly science fiction written by people in, you know, particular positions of privilege or coming from colonial powers, will often deal with this tension in sci-fi that is we want to explore far off lands we love the idea of what's beyond the horizon we love the idea of the great unknown but an inconvenient truth of that you know human history of exploring the so-called unknown is that often the unknown was actually already inhabited by someone else Mm -hmm. um and no the intrepid explorers who we tend to historically romanticize were often actually colonizers they were you know hurting people and endorsing these power structures that we're still feeling the effects of today And I think a lot of sci-fi has a tension where people want to explore that idea of, you know, what lies out there without having to deal with the kind of inconvenient truths that come with it. And a lot of sci-fi either sort of just hand waves that away through convenient things like, oh, we did colonize this entire planet, but it was uninhabited, so it's okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Or like deals with it as a really um, central theme because there's no way you can really deal with it without actually making it a central focus. So I don't think that Baxter and Pratchett are alone in having this tendency of exploring multiverses and kind of 
brushing some of the colonial aspect under the carpet. And I think that they do, I think their hearts are in the right place in terms of trying to like raise some of those questions. But I do think that there was underscoring a lot of it, a sort of unintentional romanticization of that kind of pioneering lifestyle. And like, you know, mm. you've got these uh, you know, pioneers who are very much like ye old American, but I think there's like one mention of Native Americans in the entire book. Like they kind of, they... There's a little bit of wanting to have the cake and eat it too in terms of that, I think. Mm. Yeah. And even the references to Australia, while, you know, the main Australian character is, uh, you know, an Aboriginal man and he's got one chapter that's kind of about his story, all the other little references to Australia are all about sheep farms and the mm. introduction of rabbits and, mm. you know, the modern colonial experience of Australia. So it's, I agree, it's 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 a weird kind of attitude, I guess, mm. or, or a weird blind spot maybe. Mm. I think also the way that the trolls were used mm. murkied things up a mm. bit because I think they're a really good device. They're an interesting character, but sometimes they overtly put them, they drew direct bows to historical events and other times, like sometimes they were, it, it's strange, like they, like the sugar plantation thing was the thing that really got me because that was definitely an allusion to slavery but then outside of that, they're like, the trolls are happy to help. They just like, they're curious about people. The thing that got me there was that for most of the book, they're their own thing. They're just a unique thing to this book that shows how humans treat something different as other, no matter what the evidence is, that they have sentience, they have life, they have, they deserve respect. But when they overtly tried to make it metaphor or allegorical or th things, it, it muddied that mm. a bit. Yeah, because even the trolls working on the sugar plantations are said to, like, it's not like anyone's forced them to do it. Like, the closest it comes is there's people herding them places, but you get the impression, like, there's no way that they could make them do anything, really. Like, they mm. can just leave any time they want, uh, but they don't. And yet, at the same time, the people herding them are said to have whips with them. And there's mm. sort of a weirdly uncomfortable, but also doesn't really go anywhere conversation between Helen and Joshua when they're watching this from one of the twain airships that they're on so it's yeah i agree it's weird but look i think maybe we should get into a bit more of the plot because we mm. want we want we want mm. you listener to be able to understand what we're talking about so the, okay. the other things that are set up very briefly in this first chapter apart from that incident with the troll mary and the kobold and the beagle talking to each other there are a few other things set up that we'll come back to throughout the book one is maggie kaufman who's a captain in the u.s navy who is taking uh, command of a new military airship, which are called Twains, uh, a nickname that both is delightful because it sounds like train uh, <laughs> and they use it like train, but also makes sense because it's an allusion to the first such airship, which was called the Mark Twain from the first book. So that was cute. But she's, she's taking control of one of these new Twains for this new operation that's going to start up. It's called the USS Benjamin Franklin. There's also a character who was a very minor character in the first book who only appears, I think, in about three or three chapters, maybe. I don't remember. His name's uh, Reverend Nelson. And he is considering his future in the first chapter is the only note I had about that because he doesn't really do anything. But he'll come back in a bigger way as one of the subplots of this book. Jack Green, who we don't know immediately, but find out later on is Joshua Valiente's uh, father-in-law now, is writing a speech People get freaked out because Old Faithful, the geyser at Yellowstone National Park, does not go off, which, as its name suggests, is highly unusual. <laughs> uh, never happened before. And Sister Agnes, and this was, this was a shock to me. I did not see this coming. Uh, Sister Agnes, a character from the first book who raised Joshua in the home he was raised in, he was an orphan, she wakes up. We don't know it's her at that point. We don't. I, don't, I think, it, yeah, it's not flatly stated, but I, I knew who it was. I didn't. I was like, who's this booby lady waking up? <laughs> yeah, well, she's a bit put off by the fact that she's been given a, I think the term they use is a very female form, which is like, come on, guys. <laughs> like, but on the other hand, she's not happy about it. So at least it's uh, lampshaded in a secret black corporation facility. So this is, and that's the first chapter setting up all that stuff. And then we get into the plot, which is really kicked off in Chapter 2 by Sally Lindsay arriving in this place called Hell Knows Where, which is the frontier town that we've been discussing, that kind of place, where Joshua has settled down with his wife, Helen, on Earth His Earthwest. young wife. His young wife. <laughs> I'm sorry, wife. I have to they say, say like, that, don't I? Two or three uh, times as soon as she's introduced. 
on Earth West 1,397,426. I like it when they give the Earth's numbers. There's something about that that greatly pleases my brain. Anyway, so they're quite far out from the datum Earth, but that's where they live now. And he's the mayor. They have a son named Dan. And Sally turns up saying, hey, look, there's some shit going down with the trolls. I need you to do something about it because you're famous and the politicians might listen to you. Can I just quickly say, I have no trouble with age differences. That's totally fine. What I have trouble with is the weird emphasis on it in this book and also the fact that they're just very mismatched in life experience. Mm. Just to clarify that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. And they do meet. I mean, this, the other thing is that they do meet when she's quite young. Like, they don't get together I did, until I did the later. Maths on this. No, they, they get together immediately. No, no, she's no. They're married no. by 18. No, that's it's, not true. There's surely. a 12 year age. I did the maths. Hold on, hold on. It, hold, it does actually hold the say, phone. Hold the I, phone. Because I remember, again, I had no idea who these characters were, but there were some hints about their ages when they first appeared. And I was immediately sitting there going, hold on, so he must be at least this age. And mm-hmm. maybe she's older than she seems. And then they're like, no, no, they got married at 18 well, when she yep. was 18. Like it explicitly says at one point. And then based on the son's age, she was pregnant within the year. And they've been married for nine years. So, yeah, she's 27 now. Hmm, so okay. she was 16 her dad said you need to get a trade 17 she meets joshua when he comes back 18 they're married 19 she's got a baby nine years later All she right. is just angry whenever sally shows up look i didn't do that maths but now that you have explained <laughs> it to me i'm i'm a little bit upset by it as well because you're right it's not it's not the number of years between people's ages it's about the life stages that people are at and if somebody is a full-on adult and someone else is still in that your brain's not fully cooked stage of being under 25 that is an imbalance that, you know, you do need to consider mm. and which is just sort of not really gone into very much. Yeah. I mean, the meeting is in the first book, but it's very brief. When Sally and, and Joshua are coming back from what we find out in this book has been a journey published as a book called The Journey <laughs> because it's the first <laughs> journey that goes really far into the long earth. Yeah. Sally sort of ends up going along with him and they're coming back together together. And they get to Reboot, which is the town that uh, Helen's dad and her family and a bunch of other people founded on their way back. And that's when they hear that there's been a nuclear explosion in Joshua's hometown on the original Earth. And uh, it's it's all kind of dramatic and horrendous. And I don't they don't really spend any time together, I don't think, in that book. Like it's certainly they do meet, but you're not like, oh, there's a love story that's going to blossom. So, yeah, I also thought that was a bit weird. And because you don't see them getting to know each other, I think that that uh, difference in their life stages feels more marked because we haven't seen that meeting of minds that happened between her basically as a child or little more than a child and then her 10 years on as the stay-at-home wife who sort of has to put up with him going off and heroing across the world. So I think that that makes the jump feel more noticeable as well. Yeah, And I just, again, what I don't like that what they did with Helen is when they are in Valhalla to try and find a school for their son and they're having a meeting and there's this intelligent young girl who's 15 there. Helen's very resentful towards her. She's like, oh, you sound like you've read the textbook. Like, there's all that. I was like, can you just let this character be, be chill for a second? Because she actually has a lot of potential. But they just make her a scold. And I hate that. Mm. Yeah, it was a bit gross. And also, she kind of vanishes from the book. Well, she's uh, done her bit. She's complained about her husband leaving. And then <laughs> what else can she serve the plot? She turns up yeah. for a party at the end when everything's okay again. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Look. Oh. So I'll stop my, my Helen tirade. No, no. It's totally. I'm Justice totally on for board. Helen. <laughs> I'm totally on board with this. Uh, it's how I felt about it as well. Also, like I said, I also don't like what it does with Sally. Like she's always kind of prickly and a bit of a jerk, even in the previous book. But I liked the fact that there was no, you know, they kind of totally diffused any kind of romantic tension between them by them just never even. There was that one weird bit in the first book where Joshua makes an instantly regretted comment about her legs and she lets him down pretty gently, actually, but is very clear that they will only ever be friends. And you're like, this is awkward, but also good. Now we know (laughs) that's not going to happen. We can just get on with the book. But she's quite arrogant, I think, Sally, and that's part of her character. And it makes sense. Like, she comes from a family of natural steppers. Her dad is the one who released the instructions for the stepper box and made the knowledge of stepping fully public all over the world. And she kind of feels a bit of ownership over the long earth. Anyway, this is where Sally turns up. She's a jerk. Helen's a jerk. Everyone's a jerk. Um, The only people that aren't jerks are the kids. Yeah. 
because uh, they put on a school play because they've got like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like a community homeschool kind of effort. They don't have a formal school. But they put on this school play and they do this musical, The Revenge of Captain Ahab. Oh, sorry, The Revenge of Moby Dick. Oh, my God. It's so good. <laughs> Even I Sally want... is warmed by it. Even Sally's like, you know, like I can put my arrogance on hold for an hour to enjoy this. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. My note is I want to see this play. <laughs> In The Long Earth, I found quite a few bits of it funny. Like it, it's not a comedy. Like it's, it's interesting because this is something that's come up recently online in discussions about Ghostbusters where there are these sort of weird rusted on fans who are incensed by the idea that anyone would describe Ghostbusters as a comedy apparently and looking at the discourse around this and why people are saying this it seems pretty obvious to me that what's happened is these are people who saw it when they were 10 they didn't get about 80% of the jokes in the film because it's not aimed at kids and a lot of the jokes are fairly adult centric. And so to them, it didn't reach what we call, it's kind of, the th- I, well, I, what we call, it's not an official term, um, but it didn't reach that kind of threshold because there's an idea in comedy. What makes something a comedy is basically that it has a certain number of jokes in it. And if you're talking about a visual medium, the kind of ballpark that Tim Ferguson talks about in his book about writing comedy, The Cheeky Monkey, is four jokes per minute. And that seems right to me. There, there are other ideas about that. But likewise, I think a book is a comedy book when it's making you laugh consistently. Most books, if they're well written, will have some moments of levity, just like most dramas do. But this one, I felt, just had a lot fewer funny bits than the first one. It's a sensible chuckle. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, sensible chuckle, that's it. I had one or two of those, but it was not a funny book to me at all, really. There were just one or two moments, like, you know, the school play that made me uh, chuckle a bit. But I I think I also may have noticed that more because inevitably when you're coming at a Baxter and Pratchett book when you've only read Pratchett, you're expecting it to be funny. You're expecting some element of the absurd in this sci-fi. And Mm. I don't think I've ever read a Pratchett book with so little, like, sort of overt humour. Um, and mm. I think it was more noticeable because of that. I mean, in our last episode, we read one of his short stories, which is a horror, or at least a pastiche of Christmas ghost stories of the sort of Victorian era. And it is very creepy, but at the same time, because he's chosen as his normal thing to make creepy Christmas cards, it's very silly mm. as well. So it is very funny. And this is not like that. <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's like the play, there's some good gags there. And every now and then the characters say something funny but it's, yeah, by and large, it's played very, very straight. Are you both saying that the idea of having a crossbow shoot through your heart if you try and escape from a thing is not funny? <laughs> Call me old-fashioned, Liz. I mean, I I just don't understand the humour of the youth today. <laughs> what's Where's the punchline in that, Liz? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I was so ready for Liz to make a pun. I was like, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? <laughs> uh, later, shot through when the you heart, least Liz. expect it. I was shot through the heart by that lack of a pun. <laughs> well, look, let's. There's a long let's... bow to draw. <laughs> there no. we go. <laughs> look, let's stay on target and we're going to keep going. We're going to stick with the main plot of the book. There are several there branches of pl- plot. <laughs> I think there is. I think there is. I think there's a main plot about the plight of the trolls and the main characters who are caught up in trying to do something about it. And they do go off on little sort of side trips, but none of them really diverge that much from humanity screwing up our relationship with the trolls. The trolls are leaving the Long Earth. They keep saying that this is upsetting the balance of the Long Earth, although they never really explain... Oh, there's one bit where they explain that when you go to these other worlds, what people expect is that they think of those worlds as being what the Earth would be like if there were no people there. But this book does it go out of its way at one point to explicitly say that, no, that's not true because the trolls are there. It's not like a completely unspoiled planet if there were just no people because there are trolls instead and they have an impact on the world, but in a very different way. They travel through the worlds, gathering stuff that they want, finding things where they're easy. And if there's not an easy stuff to find, they move on somewhere else. Because why would you stick around in one place when you've got such an easy way to move somewhere else where you can find more resources? And there are humans now adopting this way of living as well, who they call comers as a kind of a, an allusion to beach combing. But I think that is the main plot. It incorporates a few other things as it goes. But there's that, and then there's kind of three other main plot threads. And then there's a sort of a dangling thing that isn't really a plot. It's just a thing that they tease at the start, and then that comes back at the end. And we get periodically reminded of, which is this weird instability 
in the Yellowstone National Park. So I think I think this is the main plot. And where it starts is with Sally going to Joshua and saying, got to do something about this and him going, all right. I guess I'd argue that it's a theme, but that's, we're not going to get into a, a big thing about that. It's just because there's like so many plot points that go in different directions. I would argue that's a unifying theme, but yeah. Mm. But yes, they go to Dalam Earth to try and advocate for the trolls who are being mistreated, especially in the wake of this viral video. And yeah. that's where we get to one of my favorite sections of the book, actually, is when they're on the, the luxury twain. Oh, yeah. Which they bought in Valhalla, and I, I, I we, won't, we don't need to go into this in detail because we can't cover everything in detail, but I do like the stopover in Valhalla where they kind of established this is a city uh, founded on the new ideas of combing. So unlike a lot of the settlements that we meet that are kind of traditional modern human Western settlements in that they are doing agriculture, they're growing things, they're breeding animals, they're not really doing that. They're sort of a hub where people who are just going to other worlds all over the place and finding stuff can bring it back and trade it for other things that they need because there's no shortage of resources. So they don't need to do intensive agriculture to feed everybody and and have all the resources they need. So I kind of liked that. And we also briefly meet uh, Helen's dad, who now works as a speechwriter for the mayor of Valhalla. She, of course, disapproves and is grumpy through their whole meeting. (laughs) Yes. From a place of love, I think that's the one bit of grumpiness where I'm like, I kind of get this. Like, she feels like he's pushing himself too hard and neglecting his actual, you know, personal relationships because he blames himself for what his son did because Helen's brother was the guy who blew up the nuke in Madison. And it felt to me like, and there are a couple other scenes like this in the book, it felt to me like, This is something quite deep you're talking about, but you're giving it real short shrift here. Like you're having like one five second conversation about this that we're supposed to unpack a lot of emotional baggage from. And then you're not going to come back to it because you're really not going to revisit these characters too much during the rest of the book. Hmm. And the start of the book had quite a few moments like that as well. Like I, it took me a while to figure out who was the protagonist of this book, sort of in the same way it takes a while to figure out what the main plot might be. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, I eventually settled on, I think that this is meant to be Joshua's story. It's an ensemble cast, but it's Joshua's story. Hmm. But those first few chapters, there were points, not just, it wasn't just the alternating perspectives. It was the fact that you would sort of sit down with a character, you'd get two chapters devoted to their life story, and then it would just move on like um the australian character who helen thomas is it oh uh, thomas yeah. yeah him and even helen kind of gets like you know two chapters of pioneering recap to the days on reboot and the priest as well who uh, the minister who uh you know sort of becomes a major subplot but it was only actually in about three chapters there were just a lot of moments where someone seemed really significant because we'd sit down with them for a while we'd get this kind of intensive deep dive into their life story and then that was just done it was like okay that person's not important anymore or they'll come back for like one appearance and but, but maybe they'll be in the next book who <laughs> I feel like there's a lot this of is... sowing the seeds for sequels in this book. I I started to have so many suspicions about so many characters because of <laughs> what they did with characters from the first book in this one. But yeah, so there is that sidestep on Valhalla where they meet a couple of people who we then hear about, but then they don't really come back again. They are taking Bill with them, who it's probably worth mentioning because he will have an effect on the plot much later. But again, he sort of vanishes from the book apart from little mentions for most of the middle of it who is one of the characters who's in this book as a fairly significant character, even if he's not in a lot, who is literally mentioned as one sentence in the first book as someone who was at the home with Joshua as a child. One sentence where he's not even given exactly the same name. He's called Billy Chambers. And here he's Bill (laughs) Chambers. I had to look that up, but I was sure. He's grown up now. He's no longer a Billy. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. Anyway, but yes, so they, they have a bit of a side thing there. We meet Thomas... We get his backstory, as you say, which was quite interesting. I think Mm. we can come back to that if we've got time later. But then they get on the luxury twain from Valhalla back to the datum, which is, it sounds cool. I want to go on one. I kept picturing it as like the fancy bit of Snowpiercer from the TV show. I don't know. (laughs) Yes. So the twain is like, it's like a a dirigible. It's a helium filled airship because now they've got plenty of helium, which by the way, listener, it is a problem in our world right now that we might run out of helium. Not soon. What do you mean? But we will, well, because <laughs> yeah. that took me way Sorry. too long. That was very good. But we might we might run out of it. So stop breathing it, Liz, because uh, we get it by mining it out of the earth, like it's trapped in pockets underground. And once you use it and it escapes and it goes up into the upper atmosphere, so we're gradually running out. And 
they don't have that problem anymore because they've got all these earths and they can tap as much helium as they want and they won't run out. So that's nice. It's not how it works in the real world. Uh, and yeah, they're on it. This bit does have probably the best pun in the book, though, Liz, <laughs> in the bit where they're on the, the ship. Because they're treating Joshua with a bit of special treatment because he's the famous guy who went on the journey 10 years ago and, you know, discovered the gap and all that kind of stuff. And so they're giving him special treatment and also his family, which means his son, Dan, who really wants to be a twain driver when he, a twain oh. driver, twain driver <laughs> when so he grows cute. up. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, I should have prepared. I should have tr- tried saying uh, I want to drive a twain when I grow up seven times fast. But anyway, he's given the run of the ship, but they assign an ensign to look after him who claims his name is Boson Higgs. <laughs> I love that. Oh, it was so cheeky. Um, I think the line in it is they didn't believe that was his real name for a moment, which I thought was uh, quite funny. Uh, so that was nice. One of the last moments of true levity. <laughs> As it literally floating. I was, I was like, who's going to make the levity part? Is, I assume Liz is oh, going to make God. the levity part. <laughs> well, I say that's a lie, though, because there's another moment of levity when Joshua later on participates in a rescue and gets himself trapped. And then when he's pulled up out of the wreckage of this crashed airship, He's dangling by his ankle and his son actually says, oh, dad, it was such a sitcom moment. It was so (laughs) terrible, but also so good at the same time. Uh, But it is a fun trip. Yeah. Yeah. It brings some joy to the book. It's it's like a little, it is a little holiday within the book. Yeah. Although with, uh, as we said earlier, like, you know, some of those sort of more serious moments kind of touched on, because this is where they see the people driving the trolls with whips and uh, have a sort of very brief exchange about whether that's okay. I mean, Joshua is so naive, which is something it's true to his character from the first book as well. He's kind of very literal minded and naive and a bit of a slow, not like, he's not stupid, but he's like a slow thinker. Like he takes his time. And when they're talking about that, I think he's the one who says something like, oh, I'm sure it's just to crack the air to send a signal to them. And she sort of looks at him sideways and is like, yeah, right. <laughs> Helen knows. She knows. She gets it. But yeah, they uh, they do travel back to Datum and things have changed there. And because it's quite a long time after Step Day. It's not just 10 years after Step Day. It's like 25 years after Step Day or something because it's now, it's 2040. So like mm. Reboot was founded in 2026. And it was 25 years ago was step day. So it's, yeah, it's the future now. It's the future. (laughs) That's nice, isn't it? And when they get to the Datum Earth and they sort of go through customs, there's a a lot of very familiar post 9-11 kind of, you've got to prove who you are three times over and let us scan your shoes and go through all your luggage nonsense and they get approached by a religious guy who's like, this Yellowstone business is the judgment of God. And then they get outside and a normal looking dude with a plastic bag recognizes Joshua and says, hello, mutant or something similar. And then stakes him with an iron stake, which I thought was a nice detail. Like it sounded gross and awful, but all at the same time, I was like, yeah, because one of the things is when you step, you can't take iron with you. Um, you can take most things, but not iron. And the idea is if you stab someone with an iron stake and they step away, then the iron doesn't go with them. And so their wound is then just open and bleeding. And you're like, okay, that's kind of awful, but it makes sense. And also they think of the steppers as mutants who are monsters to be put down. So they like the sort of monster hunter allegory there. So it's, it's quite violent. I didn't see it coming. Mm. Mm. I thought if anything was going to happen, it was going to be the weird religious guy and then suddenly normal guy with plastic bag and also good moment for Helen. Yeah. Finally. I found a really interesting, speaking of the political exploration of these anecdotes, the fact that Helen actually got imprisoned briefly for the self-defense. I thought that was a really interesting moment of... I don't know, I just I think there was a political commentary in the fact that they were clearly victims of this attack, but they mm. still, and even with all of Joshua's influence, they still had to, you know, jump through some hoops to get Helen out for just, you know, punching someone who'd literally staked her husband. <laughs> um, I found yeah. that very interesting. <laughs> because they're other and they're protecting their own, even if their own is actually the villain. Mm. But a really interesting thing from that section as well was how, I can't remember who pointed out possibly Helen about why are they going through all the security when you could just step somewhere else within like just a few kilometers away, basically. Mm. Um, but it's symbolic to show your people like how other these people are, how dangerous they are. We have to go through these processes. It's all about making that distinction and making elsewhere seem unappealing 
Mm. Yeah, and also look at us keeping you safe from these terrible people, something I think every Australian should be able to recognise from our own government's behaviour. We know that there are still boats of people trying to get here to save themselves from horrible situations elsewhere. They haven't stopped coming, but they stopped arriving because they get towed back or they get taken somewhere else. And that allows the government to control that rhetoric. So it is about that appearance of control and safety rather than about actually doing anything about the problems they claim that they're controlling. And it's true to life, unfortunately. And I think in a way that's actually stated kind of explicitly in Joshua's following conversation with the senator, where the senator essentially says to him, it's about the story. Like, give me something I can work with with the media. I don't really care either way. I just need something I can work with as a politician. And that's not really a language that Joshua speaks because he is quite an sort of earnest, naive person who just is, is sort of like, well, you're doing a bad thing. Can you do something about stopping it? And the senator's like, that's not how this works. <laughs> mm. That whole sequence was also very well written, I thought, mm. at that meeting. Yeah, and telling yeah. it from the perspective of um, the senator's, uh, was it his eight? Um, I thought I th- that was a really so. interesting way of doing it too. We didn't get the senator's perspective. We got the perspective of the person who is constantly managing the senator. Yeah, Marlon Jackson. Yeah, and that gave us this outside perspective on Joshua as well, which uh, we hadn't, I don't know if up to that point we'd really seen Joshua from an arm's length. Like we'd only really seen him through other perspectives of people who already knew him quite intimately. Mm. Mm. It's also the first time we really hear from Bill, who speaks up during that meeting and basically calls bullshit on all the things that the senator is saying in quite a blunt way. And the senator literally just says, I have nothing more to say to your friend, but I'll keep talking to you. And you're like, OK, well, this is a depressingly realistic feeling way to depict politics, not just in the US, but in a lot of the worlds right now. So, again, it felt a bit prescient because you remember this was written and published before Trump was elected. Like, this was written during Obama's presidency. So this is like peering into the future going, what would conservative politicians be like in the future? They'll be awful. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) Called it. (laughs) (laughs) One of the notes that I had from this section of the book was that it's fascinating that what is technically to us home is written as the most horrific place up to that point. Mm. In the story, like it's horrible to go back, and you, I couldn't wait for them to leave. Mm. I was like, get away from there as soon as possible. And that's supposed to be like home, like that's our planet. There should yeah. be a fondness there, but it was written as the worst place. Yeah, I, that's true. I think it's interesting though that it's also juxtaposed with a lot of the characters coming back to the datum Earth and feeling a sort of comfort. I think it's Maggie Kaufman, the captain of the Benjamin Franklin, who when they come back to repair the ship sees all of the cities and everything and even though she doesn't think of herself as a city person because she grew up in the country she's like oh but this feels like home this is like what i'm used to as a human being there's like big congregations of people living together with lots of infrastructure that's what i've known my whole life and then out there in the long earth there's nothing you know there's like small communities who have to figure stuff out for themselves there's that tension there between the date of earth is awful but also it's so much closer to what we think of as home. So a lot of the characters still value it that way. I wonder if it also depends on whose perspective we're in at each time, because I agree with Liz that I I often felt that sense of like when they were on Datum Earth, it wasn't sort of the home that I know. I didn't feel that sense of comfort and I wanted them to get out, sort of go out into the other worlds where they felt more (laughs) at peace. But that was through, you know, Joshua's perspective and Helen's perspective and to some extent even um, Spooky's perspective. Whereas, you know, someone like Maggie Kaufman, even though she becomes more connected with these external worlds, the more that she travels through them and gets to know people she is still like a datum earth person like that's where she's grounded and so we get that alternative perspective on it from her so yeah I I agree with you both I think that there's that tension and that like I think mostly through the book you feel that sort of aversion to the datum earth because um, the characters are mostly moving away from it and so we are moving with them but I think that that you also catch those little glimpses of that nostalgia from people like us who are used to that as home hmm Yeah, it's the joy of having so many different perspectives in a book like this. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Not yeah. the way I did, the way you did. I'm not just like, <laughs> well on me, summarizing it like that. Good yeah. job, Elizabeth. Liz is just like patting herself <laughs> on the back, like, oh yeah, Dion, you were fine. But like, I, I really hit on that, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make myself a mug saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, don't, don't mention any more potential merchandise. Um, but look, so after the meeting with the senator, 
This is where we, we re-meet one of the characters from the first book and from the start of this book because the senator puts Joshua off a bit by mentioning Agnes, Sister Agnes, who raised him, and just sort of casually, it's kind of implied that he's doing it just to show, see, I know more about you than you really comfortable me knowing about you. And he's a bit put off by that. But that puts her in back into his mind and he goes to do something that he kind of wanted to do anyway, which is go and pay his respects at her grave. And while he's there, a nun comes to speak to him in a very... And it's none other than... Ter- oh, God. <laughs> Should have expected that. Uh, but yes, it is none other than Sister Agnes, who's been brought back by Lob saying, as we suspected in the first chapter, in a synthetic body. And uh, the next couple of chapters go through her describing what that process was like for her learning how to be at ease in her new body. I thought they did a good job of being quite ambiguous about whether it was the technology or the, you know, all these Tibetan monks chanting from the Book of the Dead for like, what was it, like four weeks or something to try and bring her back. But also it felt very sinister. I I was kind of glad that in the end Agnes was like, yeah, all right, I'm okay with this. And she wasn't ever too put out because I think if she'd shown any distress, I would have been totally not on board with this plot thread. And she is confused and a bit annoyed, but she's never like, this is a horrifying thing that you've done. Am I even... And she does, you know, she has all those philosophical questions. Am I really her? Am I just a collection of brainwaves or, you know, memories that have been extracted from a corpse and I'm not a real person? Do I have a soul? Like, it's it's interesting to put a Catholic nun <laughs> into that position, much as it's interesting to put a supposedly Tibetan motorcycle repairman in that position. And Lob Seng does seem to confirm in this book that he truly does believe that's who he is. He says he has memories of that life, uh, which kind of puts them both in the same kind of boat, except that we know Agnes was a real person before, and we don't know that for 100% certain about Lob saying, but because it's been done for her, I think it sort of adds credence to his backstory and his claims of who he is. And it does occur to me now that you say that, it's interesting because she, she's basically brought back to act as a conscience of sorts for him to keep him in check. But it's fascinating because she loves motorcycles. He's supposed to be a motorcycle repairman. And it's just kind of like a beautiful partnership. Like that's kind of, I hadn't thought about that at all. I that's, hadn't thought about that either until now. That is that is kind of awesome. It's very tidy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Agnes and Lobsang had uh, one of the most interesting relationships in the book. And to be honest, I could almost just read a spin-off story about those two. Like they're almost like a sick couple in the middle of a very different genre <laughs> like mm. she makes that joke like when he's talking about why he brought her back and he's listing things like you know you're my conscience or are you my soul or whatever and she's like am I your nagging wife and that's <laughs> it's like she decides that that's the vibe she's going to go for and you catch these glimpses of their sort of domestic life afterwards where you know he's like he's cleaning the yard and like feeding the chickens or whatever and he's like yeah Agnes told me I should do this and I just you know whatever <laughs> like they they have a very strange vibe and it's almost like they're play acting at being this sort of sitcom couple in the hopes that they can convince themselves of the truth of it. And I found that mm. uh, dynamic between them kind of hard to pin down, but fascinating. And that also, I think, made me feel more okay, as you say, about the fact that he had basically like brought her to life without her consent beforehand, because it seemed like she was, she decided to own it and they were going to figure it out between themselves. Hmm. And they do pretend to be a married couple at one point in the book. (laughs) Talking about that, it also throws more kind of shade in a way Mm. on the relationship between Joshua and Helen because it's like you're clearly aware that this is a trope. You're you're talking about it, but then you're also doing it. Like you can't have your cake and eat it too. Like what are you doing here? So, yeah, it's a bit... It's a bit on the nose there, but but this is, yeah, I agree. This is one of the best relationships in the book. It's great. Though it did just do a strange thing for me because I kept being like, oh, yeah, Jansen's really sick. Like, she's really unwell. And I was kind of like, does death have stakes in this book anymore? Mm. Well, I strangely didn't feel that about when Joshua was in danger. I was like, if he dies, he's going to actually die. Well, so, yeah, because he's going to yeah. die suddenly and he's away from any kind of, because presumably you need a bunch of technology or at least you need to have organized a bunch of monks to chant in order to do this, right? So you have to know someone's going to die. But I did wonder that at the end where, and and look, as usual, we will spoil this book, but we'll try not to spoil any other books uh, too much, except maybe the prequel to this one. But when Jansen does presumably die at the end, like it's not written to really be unambiguous that that's what happens. I did wonder, is she dead? Is she going to, and I I think we'll come back to that because I have a lot of feelings about that scene. But yeah, it does, it does make you wonder. I think we're going to have to blitz through some plot points as much as we'd like to 
spend some time on it, but I reckon we're going to have to just do a sort of like a, a wine tasting of <laughs> of some of the many varied, wonderful varietals. That's cool. You can still get drunk at a wine tasting. You absolutely can. <laughs> uh, yes, you can. And I, I feel like that's a good way to think about this book, actually. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, look, Drunk. that's okay because this is where the <laughs> plot kind of that main plot I was talking about, as much as there's still a lot of sort of sidesteps and, and kind of tourism of the long earth along the way, which I enjoyed as much as I did in the first book. Um, it, I, I said then and I, I felt it again now, it feels a little bit like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea at times. Like as much as there's a plot, we are not going to shy away from going, look at all this cool shit as we're on our way from one bit of the plot to another. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. Since the previous one of these books, I haven't really read a book like that and I really dug it. So it never felt, I was never bored during this book. Like there were never any bits where I was like, oh, I'm over this. But this is where the plot does kick in a bit more because while Joshua is meeting with Agnes, Sally goes back to meet with Jansen and says, hey, I want you to help me out and takes her to the gap or the gap space facility next to the gap to free the troll Mary. And they find that that place basically is like run by a bunch of amateur nerds who are really into space because I love it. it turns out if you can make a spaceship, you can take stepwise. Then going from the Earth into a world where there is no Earth is a really cheap and easy way to get into space. So they're trying to do that. And that's where Mary was being experimented on. And they were not okay with this. Um, so they go there, they free her. And just as a decide, they mentioned that this, the leader of this gap space facility is a guy named Gareth Eames. And he doesn't appear in the book. He's only mentioned a few times. But I'm pretty sure he's the same character from the first book who appears in one chapter, whose name is Gareth, no surname ever given, who was an acoustics student who goes to a old stone circle to prove a theory that it's they're actually uh, lithophones. You can play them like an instrument and has an encounter with some trolls and gets super freaked out. And in this book, it's described that he just hates trolls and they don't say why. So I'm pretty sure it's meant to be the same character, <laughs> but there is no way to know that without <laughs> looking up the previous book. And even then it's like a bit vague. So anyway, they free Mary, the troll and her son, and they take them off. Um, Very biblical. And yeah. News of that escape gets back to the Datum Earth, and this is what triggers Lob saying to go, hey, Joshua, please come and see me. And this is where we have a scene where Joshua thinks about it, and then he does go to see him, and we unpack why haven't they spoken for the 10 years since the explosion, and it turns out Joshua blames him. He thinks like, you know, you this godlike being, you're everywhere, you see everything, you should have known this was coming, you could have done something to stop it, and you didn't. And they have this argument where Lob saying it's like, I couldn't do that. And also, would it even be right for me to do that? You want me to kill some people to stop a nuclear bomb going off and then it's like a theoretical crime that didn't even happen? They didn't really go into that in too much depth, but I felt like the things they said about it kind of nailed the philosophical points of that argument. Basically, he reveals that, look, I've been studying the trolls. They're so smart. There's, they've got all this stuff going on that seems like a natural evolutionary reaction to being able to step. And if they're not out there in the long earth, it's upsetting the balance of the long earth. And he kind of goes into a little bit about why he thinks that, but mostly it's kind of taken as a given that them being present is a good thing. And since Mary's been rescued, they're leaving all the worlds where humans are and going somewhere where no one knows where it is. And everyone's freaking out a little bit, partly because they're losing all this free labor, but also because it's weird and they don't know what's going on. So uh, Lobsang wants Joshua to do something about it, to go out and find Sally and Mary and Jansen, where they've gone and find where the trolls have gone and try and convince them to come back. Joshua thinks about it very briefly, but basically goes, yeah, all right, I'm going to go. This seems like the right thing to do. Wife will be mad at me, but ah, she'll deal. <laughs> yeah, that was terrible. And also he doesn't even tell her in the end. Like he's, because he, Bill shows up and says, yeah, Lobsang got in touch with me and said you were going on a trip and I should go with you. And Joshua's like, oh okay, well, look, I should go home and tell Helen. And Bill's like, nah, she already knows. And you're like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? This is terrible. But I mean, it's a nice departure from like Bill's main dialogue being to remind us that he is Irish. Oh my God, yes. That's <laughs> true. I was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, at one point he actually says Pogs Mahoney. And I'm yeah. like, mate, that's, I don't think that's how Irish people use that phrase. But okay, well, that's that's fine. I mean, I used to go. I used to go to a pub that was called that. But you know, <laughs> anyway. But yeah, uh, and they he basically just was saying, "I am Irish. I'm Irish. I'm Irish." Yeah. And then he'd like take a brief pause to be like really politically scathing, and then back to "I'm Irish. <laughs> I'm Irish." <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I did. Well, I mean, I did like the way that he was talking about because the thing he says to the sender that really pisses him off in the earlier scene is like, why do you think the America can govern all of these stepwise copies of America? England couldn't even govern one Ireland. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> oh, pointed, but on the money. <laughs> and we don't know what's happened with the UK and Ireland in the future. We really don't even touch on it. We visit there, but nothing is said about the political kind of situation. So maybe maybe this is why Pratchett and Baxter didn't want to set it in the UK. Maybe they were like, we'll talk about America. Like, we can make whatever we want happen in America and we won't feel weird about it. Whereas yeah. if we start to look at, you know, like, do the Brexit. troubles reignite? Is there a division in the UK? Like, that would be too close to home and we don't want to... Yeah. Because I don't even... When did Brexit start becoming a thing? Would that have been being discussed by this time? I think it's a little bit afterwards, but I could be wrong. I just feel like they literally exit Britain. That's true. <laughs> they do. They do. Into the gap. That's right. Yeah, because one of the things I was going to say before when we were talking about that confused relationship with colonialism that this book has was that I do wonder if they, as two British writers, were just like, well, who are we to even begin talking about colonialism from a British perspective in a British context? Mm. Like, that's like a whole, you know, historical and current political novel in and of itself. So it kind of feels like they were sort of dodging the issue entirely on that one because there was just too much to unpack there within their own context yeah i mean this book does come some years after nation which is another non-discworld book and it's mm. it's not like this at all but it, i think it's probably the novel where pratchett tackles sort of issues of colonialism most directly i'm not criticizing pratchett or baxter in observing that i think that this has kind of a confused relationship with colonialism i think they do raise some interesting points it seems like their intentions were in the right place it's more i think that it's such a complex issue that mm. they've kind of only scratched the surface of it here for better or worse you know yeah Hmm. Speaking of, of people setting out to go to other places, that is what Joshua and Bill are now going to do because they get their in own. In the shillelagh. Their tw- yeah, their own little twain that he calls the shillelagh because he can't do anything by halves. Uh, it's, it's all got to be Irish all the time. Um, but they don't go off looking randomly. Bill has an idea where he wants to leave from a particular place. I think it's in Seattle. He's got a particular destination in mind because it turns out that even though he's been living in hell knows where, he is kind of a coma and he's been going off and doing his sort of jaunts around the long earth just finding stuff and living off the land and he knows that a lot of comas take advantage of the worlds that they call jokers which is an old school pratchett term which he used in one of his really early books but it just means like a planet that is unlike all of its neighbors in the long earth there's something weird about it and in particular, he goes to one that Joshua went to in the first book, which is covered in giant locusts and all these insects. But he goes up above the cloud cover, up the side of a mountain, and finds like a place where there's not too many insects. And it's there that they meet up with a kobold who Bill has met before and who we've met before because it's the same kobold from the opening chapter who has been given a name by Bill. who He doesn't share his real kobold name. But he's called Finn McCool because <laughs> you've got to stick with it. everything's got to be Irish. Uh, but he is, as established in the first chapter, and I love this, obsessed with 1960s rock and roll music. No kink shaming. No, I'm not. <laughs> I would never kink shame. I love the kinks. And um, I'm a huge fan. And in fact, I love this particular album. I've only listened to the whole album once or twice, but he asked for a copy of The Kinks Are the Village Preservation Society on cassette and gets a whole bunch of extras so presumably it's a bootleg because it's got a whole bunch of other stuff on it as well and i just oh i love this so much they mentioned that most kobolds are kind of fascinated with human culture in a way which is why there's been this contact with humans because there's a whole chapter where somebody posits how they evolved and the relationship they have to human folklore which i thought was quite interesting a bit sort of tell don't show but still it was quite nice but yeah this particular one loves 1960s rock music and they trade this cassette with him for information about where the trolls might have gone. And he only just gives them a hint that they're hiding out on a joker. But he doesn't say which one or where before they're attacked by elves, one of the other horrible humanoid creatures. I was really hoping this would get unpacked more and we'd find out more about the culture of kobolds. But it didn't really happen. We only kind of ever really meet Finn McCool. But what happens is when the elves attack is he steps away and Joshua's trying to get away from the elves. And then... Fimical steps back with a bunch of other kobolds and they start fighting with the elves to give Joshua a chance to escape. 
And just as Joshua is escaping on the twain, he looks down and he sees that Finn is, there's an elf getting the better of him. And he's like, oh no, I've got to go back and help him. So he jumps down and goes and hits this elf with a tree trunk. And there's a great description of how it doesn't really go thunk. It just sort of explodes in a <laughs> bunch of mold or something. But then he's like furious. Like he feels like he's been dishonored because, and and we don't really get the explanation. Bill just sort of hamfistly says his sense of honor is damaged because he was supposed to be saving you and then you saved him. And I was really hoping we'd find out more about how that works, but we didn't. And it comes back a little bit as motivation for that character later on. And I, But I guess it kind of works that we don't understand it, because the whole point is that we're supposed to realize that these other creatures that are intelligent and humanoid are not human, and they don't think like humans, and their culture is kind of indecipherable to us as much as we might try to put human labels and understanding on it. So maybe maybe that was intentional, and that's why. But yeah, they, they escape. And they keep searching. Meanwhile, Sally and Spooky have come to a world that they also visited during the first book, which they refer to as Rectangles. I thought that's a great name for a place. I want to go somewhere called Rectangles. It's not nearly as fun as it sounds. There's radioactive waste there. <laughs> that's true. But I would like, I, I feel like Rectangles could be, you ever go to one of those like Instagram experience kind of things, <laughs> like, you know, where they have all the giant candies and stuff and you can take photos or all the, all the weird perspective images. I feel like someone should make one called rectangles. <laughs> you could just be the change you want to see. It reminds, yeah, yeah. This is your new business venture, Ben. Oh no! Um, it reminds me of, like bounce. You know that place that's all trampolines. Yeah. It just it just sounds like kind of a novelty place that you go to for the photo ops <laughs> or for the like one off good time. <laughs> Much pointier than the ball pit rectangles. <laughs> it's just all these cubes. Um, and radioactive and bricks yeah. and radioactive waste yeah uh, but anyway <laughs> this this world is cool it's like the really cool place that i hoped they would revisit because i remembered it so vividly from the first book and it's you know a world where there's no human-like creatures but there does seem to have been this intelligent dinosaur-like species who had advanced technology and there's these radioactive sort of piles left behind and they found a whole bunch of corpses and on the corpses this is where they found the weird ring and we know that it wasn't the only one because the beagle dog person had one in this first chapter and Joshua has got one that he kept from this mission that has cropped up in the story and he's taken it with him on this trip for no readily apparent reason than he thought it might be a good thing to take with him. So they've turned up on this rectangles world and before too long they meet this dog person who looks kind of like a wolf person but is they're referred to as beagles who was expecting them because the kobolds told him that they were coming. And this beagle takes them to the home world of the beagles. After, like, having a raging boner. That, that is kind of over the top. Yeah. That was weird. This, I gotta say that this book was really weird for me as a dog lover. <laughs> like, just the <laughs> oh, entire, yeah, yeah, like, the entire beagle society I just felt very conflicted about because, like, my dog-loving instinct was like, giant dogs with jewelry, so cute, they've got a little society, but then they were, like, eating people and getting boaters and just being awful. I'm like, these are not the beagles I know. Um, and <laughs> I, I, those couple of glimpses we had of them at the beginning, like, we saw the, the queen or the granddaughter or whatever they call her right at the start. Um, mm. And I was imagining, like, an actual little beagle and then when they came in like you know 200 pages later and they were like seven feet tall I had to completely reimagine everything that I'd been operating on up to that point and so then it was like just these giant uncanny dog monsters that I was imagining and I was just very conflicted about the whole thing it was scary Mm. yeah they were unnerving I think they did do quite a good job of showing different personalities within that really rough world though because they we get to know kind of three beagles relatively well considering like how much is packed into this book and i thought that was like they do actually show this society through hints quite well yeah i thought so too yeah i i felt though that this was one of the bits particularly towards the end of the book i felt there was a lot of stuff in here that felt in a way like this was kind of recycled stuff from pratchett's oeuvre because the beagle society feels a lot like the werewolves in the fifth elephant yeah right? and they even have the hunt yeah, they have the hunt just like they do in that. And Joshua goes on the run just like Vimes does. I mean, it's not just like, it's different, but it felt like an echo of that. And there were a couple of other things in the book too that felt to me like, oh, that feels like Pratchett wanted another go at this idea. And I mean, that's something he does within the Discworld series as well. Like he'll often revisit something and, you know, reinvent it or develop it further. They go to the heel drum. The heel drum, yes. <laughs> yeah. There is a heel drum. 
But I, yeah, I, it is weird. And, and again, I think, you know, they did a good job of making it feel unsettling where we kind of were making all these assumptions about what these creatures would be like because they look like dogs or wolves and they use English. Like they've learned a version of English in order to communicate with humans, but also with other non-human humanoids. I mean, it's, it's a bit coincidental that it happens to be English when that is not the majority language of the world. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it works for the plot of the book and, Particularly they're in America. You, like. They're in America. That's true. They're in the same part of the world as America. And they're Westwoods, aren't they? So they probably mostly get English-speaking American explorers coming through. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I do agree. It's convenient that they're speaking dog English. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's all these non-humans. They get taken to the world of the Beagles. They then meet Finn McCool, who's also there, because the Beagles can't step. This is an important part of their culture. They They can't. And one of the things that's explained is that it seems like most of these humanoid creatures are uh, offshoots from a common ancestor very early on in the human line. And some of them have stepped away when they've become sort of intelligent enough that that's something they can do and then kept that stepping ability like the trolls. Some of them have stepped away to somewhere else and then lost it because they didn't really need it anymore. And there's a theory that maybe that's what's happened with the beagles or maybe they are just evolved from something else entirely, like actual wolf ancestors or something. But anyway, they meet one of their leaders whose name is Petra. I, for no readily apparent reason. Um, they don't, that's never explained, that reference. And it turns out that Petra and her clan trade with Finn McCool for these high-tech weapons that look like ray guns that he gets from uh, Rectangles, the destroyed dinosaur-like civilization that once had this amazing technology. But he's run out, and Sally sort of twigs to this and realizes that the guns that he's given them have run out of power. And so in order to sort of get what she wants, which is to get to talk to the trolls who are hiding out on the Beagle's world and also to get Mary to be able to stay here and be safe. She's like, well, I could get you more of those. You don't need him anymore. I can get you more. She's worked out that this ring that the Beagle leader has, it must be the key to getting them. I mean, it turns out it's a literal key, which I kind of did think might be the case because I played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> uh, but um, also, you know, she's pretty canny. So she, she realizes she's got to go and get Joshua's ring and she leaves Jansen behind while she goes off to get it um, in order to hopefully broker this deal, but maybe bluff her way out of it without actually giving these vicious wolf-like creatures energy weapons, which seems <laughs> yeah. like a really bad idea. Yeah. They've had them before, so if they get them again, like, whatever. Yeah, I did like true. that there was a disclaimer. Like, you know, I think we as the reader were with Jansen where we're like, what the hell, what are you doing? Don't give them the <laughs> aliens weapons. And Sally was like, it's fine, it's fine. And then later on when she's like, okay, I'm going to give them the weapons, but self-contained world, they're not interested in going anywhere else. They're just going to kill themselves off. It's fine. We're just helping the circle of life along on this one world. <laughs> so I was like, there's a little bit of self-justification going on there, but okay, at least we're not leading to, again, for a while I thought that would be the long war. Like I thought they were going to give the dogs weapons the dogs were going to go out and like try and conquer all these other worlds like no nope, they're fine they're just going to kill themselves off it's all good oh, no. they're going to end up like the cromags in sliders oh. <laughs> yeah. but yeah it was a bit weird because also sally has such a disdain for other humans but seems to really care about the trolls although she's never particularly caring to them apart from the sort of practical things she does for mary uh, and and you know towards the healing the relationship between trolls and humans but she you never see her really interacting in any kind of tender or caring way with any trolls so it's a bit of a weird thing her love language is different <laughs> it's fair yeah. uh, more acts of service than words of affirmation <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll believe it but she really doesn't seem to care much about the beagles either because they're horrible except for the nice ones so that suggests there's actually more nice ones so actually hmm. that's true um, and I mean, I do like that one of the other funny bits towards the end of the book is when they find out the various uh, Beagles names and they find out that the really tall a white one um, <laughs> who is the one, unfortunately, with the with the boner. Uh, but uh, Give a dog who, a boner. And, Sorry. And, <laughs> I just feel like if there was any out. podcast where I could make that part, it would be this one. <laughs> it's the, yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you for ruining Tintin's dog for me. <laughs> no. Yeah, because he turns out he's called Snowy. It's interesting we never find out who the humans are who've given them these yeah. names. Like, Literally it's... Tintin. What is that? Tintin's based on a true story. <laughs> oh, this this Tintin dog does off screen. Massive... Um, yeah, <laughs> so I think it's... we're going to find out about Captain Haddock at some point. This is, Ooh, this is... Literal fish. Know. Yeah, probably. There's a world where Captain Haddock was just evolved as a fish. <laughs> um, oh, no. Second person singular world. <laughs> yeah. 
And I did mm. find, uh, just going back to your point briefly, but I did find it really interesting that there were these hints of other humans coming through the worlds and we Mm. saw that throughout the long war um you know another example was uh thomas finding that picture that was in the same place that he had known it um you know on the rock across you know you know different worlds and there were those glimpses of the idea that humans had actually been stepping and crossing and, you know, communicating with other creatures on other worlds for a long time and that techno- and that had just sort of been lost. But there was also this overwhelming sense of, you know, infinity and emptiness about the worlds, this sense that, you know, the, a big part of the premise of this series seems to be that there are all these worlds that humans had never touched and now they're exploring them for the first time. And, it was, yeah, I'm not really sure where I'm going with that point, except to say that I kind of had this dual sense of what this multiverse was like, um, you know, whether it was meant to be about first contact across uh, all these existences that humans hadn't known before, or whether it was about following in the footsteps of people who had gone before, but who we still can only see the faintest glimpses of. Yeah. In the first book, it, they don't really explicitly give you the story of how stepping in humans has gone, but they do say that throughout human history, people have accidentally stepped. And when they get to happy landings, it's a place where a lot of people who accidentally step eventually end up. But there is there is this sort of idea that humans who can naturally step and control where they're going is very, very rare and for the most part, fairly recent. But I did find like when they, they tell Thomas Kangu's backstory and there's that bit where he steps into Earthwest 5 of where he grew up in Western Australia and he finds a copy of a sketch on a rock that's clearly thousands of years old that only he knows is there. Mm. I found that very confusing because I'm like, why would you make the same picture in the same place in two different worlds? And and also I felt kind of weird about what that said. Like it felt a bit like a rewriting of Aboriginal history in mm. Australia to say, oh, yeah, of course they could survive in the desert because they could step and go sideways and find more food. Whereas in the first book, when Step Day happens, there's a bunch of Aboriginal folks in the story and they're not major characters. It's just one of the sort of little vignettes to show how this is affecting the world where they go, yeah, fuck this, we're out of here. We're going to go to an Australia that hasn't been fucked up by colonists from England. Let's go. (laughs) And uh, a whole bunch of them go for that reason, which I think, again, is a weird kind of, and I don't remember if this is something we discussed then, but it felt to me both like understandable, but also like part of that culture is such a deep connection to country. Yep. Would you really feel like it's okay to go to a copy of that country that isn't the one you were born in? Like I, it sort of feels like they're trying to not have their cake and eat it too, but it's not a clear understanding of how those things work. And it's coming through a bit garbled. And, and in this case, it's also kind of muddying the kind of lore of the world. I'm really glad you brought that up because that was the thing that struck me most about Thomas's story. I think it was another example of good intentions, incomplete understanding of the culture and well, cultures, plural, that it was sort of attempting to represent. And I thought that moment where he found the picture on the rock in another world was symbolically quite beautiful. That idea of, you know, feeling that connection with someone from his culture from, you know, countless millennia ago across worlds. But I felt that the general message about, uh, you know, of Australia First Nations people seeing an opportunity to like leave Australia and going yeah kind of like it was trying to be sympathetic as regards to colonialism and saying oh yeah of course they would hate colonizers and want to go somewhere where colonization wasn't a thing but it totally disregarded the fact that connection to country is a huge aspect of First Nations culture and you know so much of uh you know First Nations advocacy is about you know reclamation of country not leaving country behind. Hmm. Hmm. I agree with both of you about that. In terms of the very specific question about why would you mark the different worlds, I read that one specifically as maybe one person who happened to step keeping track of where they'd already been. Mm. Mm. Yeah, okay. Well, that that makes sense. That's a pretty straightforward explanation, really. But um, that was yeah. just very specific. I completely agree. And I also I felt weird reading that section because it did not feel right. But yeah, in terms of the picture itself, I, I read that as just like, I've oh, yeah, been here, going to mark that one. Mm. Next one, going to mark that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think it was the conclusion that he then draws that, oh, yeah, this is how they survived out in the desert. And you're like, no, mm. man, it survives <laughs> in the desert because they know where the food is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and when to not stay in this part of the desert. Like they, yeah. I mean, 
look, maybe there's a nice thing there to sort of suggest that's part of it. But again, it's it's one thing to take the folklore of your own culture and go, actually, it was aliens. And it's another thing to take the folklore of another living culture and say, that was aliens too, mm. you know, in a stargate kind of way. Mm. Look, you know, it, it suits the story that it's trying to tell. But I think in, in 2021, we probably are thinking about that in a very different way mm. to in, even in 2011 when this would have been being written. Mm. But look, uh, let's, let's get back to the plot because we want to try and get to the end, at least of this main plot so we can start talking about the other ones because <laughs> there's so many. I mean, it gets a little bit complicated here because Sally has this sort of I, not complicated plan, but maybe slightly convoluted plan. It's a silly it, plan. It's a it's bad a silly plan. plan. <laughs> but look, she, she's like, okay, I'm going to try and stall for time so I can make this promise that I'm going to bring these weapons back, but I'm going to try not to have to deliver on that promise. So she takes... Uh, Jansen to um, Rectangles and leaves her somewhere safe where she can only be seen from the air and then she goes off to try and steal Joshua's ring which he thinks is still hanging up in Jansen's house back in Madison West 5 but it's not it's on the airship and she eventually figures this out and finds it and there's a weird bit where oh yeah where he smells her <laughs> yeah and you know I thought that was a reference to something in the first book but I went looking I couldn't I couldn't find anything so it, it was just Oh, it was just weird. And then there's the bit where he goes, he resolves never to tell Helen about mm-hmm. it. And you're like, you do not have a good trust relationship, you two. Like, this could be such a different, what, written in such a different way and it would be fine. And I don't need this tension. Uh, it's enough that she's a prickly jerk. Like, it doesn't need to be this whole, like, jealous relationship. But anyway, mm. so she steals it and eventually... While they're searching Joker worlds and then Diamond worlds, which are like the opposite of Jokers, they're weird, but in a cool way rather than weird and in a terrible way. Um, <laughs> he realizes that it's gone and he realizes, wait, that wasn't a dream. She's stolen it. And the only reason I can think of why she would steal it is if she needs it to go back to that world. So that's where we should go. That must be where they are. And so they go there, they meet Jansen and they go back to the Beagle world where they've kind of told the Beagles that Joshua's like a representative of Earth, basically, an envoy of humanity, and he sort of goes along with it. And I mean, none of them have figured out. <laughs> it's technically mm. kind of as correct as it can I guess be. It's true, yeah. <laughs> but he he kind of, he goes along with it, and none of them have worked out. And Sally is good enough a little bit later in the book to say, "Yep, well, I made a mistake about what they would do with this information because what they do is they hold him down." And they do a crude version of something that's introduced earlier in the book that's kind of horrifying, which is stapling. Basically, they put a bit of iron in you. That means if you step, the iron will disappear and then you will bleed to death because you've damaged your insides. And they do a version of that on him, which is like a little crossbow stitched into his back with a bolt pointing at his heart, ready to spring. And there's a pin in it that stops it from doing that that's made of iron. So if he steps, he's going to get this sharp bone thing through his which seemed a bit convoluted. I'm like, surely there's a simpler way of doing that. <laughs> I, like, I can't imagine it either. I was like, is this a giant thing? I, help? Mm. I don't, mm, I couldn't Yeah, I was imagining it. him walking around with like a giant plank sticking out of his back, but that just didn't seem practical with half of what was mm. happening. So I was like, I assume it's smaller than they're making it sound. Yeah, I, I kind of assumed that the bolt would be like kind of toothpick sized and they've actually like sort of embedded it inside his back. So it's like pointing but then it's got to go through his ribs to get to his heart. Like it just, like I got, I got the idea of it, but I was also like, I'm not going to try and think about it too much because I don't think it works <laughs> because they describe it as the way that some criminal gangs do it on earth because they can't do it the more sophisticated. They can't do like open chest surgery, I guess. So they sort of implant it in your back. I don't know. Anyway, they stop him from leaving and basically he becomes a hostage, which means Sally has to follow through on the deal. She has to go to rectangles and bring back these ray guns. But he's Uh, allowed to wander off and talk to yetis and hologram lob saying. It's part of the deal, right? It's part of the deal. So he's allowed to go and talk to the trolls, which is what he wants. But he also has to stay there so that Sally will do what they want, which is bring back the ray guns. So Sally goes off to rectangles with Jansen. They find a stockpile. They go with Finn McCool, who shows them how to use the ring. And it's kind of cool, like, spin it and it flies under the air and goes into the ground and opens up a secret chamber that's full of things. And I'm like, this is very Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I wanted to spend then... more time in the secret chamber. I could have had a whole book in there. Like, she was in and out in five minutes. <laughs> I really, yeah. really hope this comes back even more in a future mm. one because they kept dropping all these hints that there was more to it than it seemed. Mm. And I'm like, surely that's got to be true. That's I want to know more about mm. this. 
Because Sally's such a jerk about it. She's like, oh yeah, a flying ring that unlocks a secret chamber underground. Whatever, seen it all before. And I'm like, it's 2040. You do not have this technology. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but that anyway. was the games master and you being like, appreciate the cool D&D references, Sally. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to steal this and put it in my game. No, anyway, they. Uh, I mean, I probably will. It's really cool. But they, they did that. Um, and Jansen volunteers to go down and get the ray guns because it's radioactive down there. She's like, I'm already dying of leukemia from radiation poisoning. Like, how much worse can it get? And you're like, well, worse, but okay, I'd take your point. Because she's only got eight minutes before the door closes. So she goes down, finds some ray guns, comes back. Meanwhile, Joshua is allowed to speak to the trolls and he and Bill set up this device that Lobsang gave them. And it turns out it's a hologram projector. So Lobs, just as Joshua's trying to figure out what to say, Lobsang turns up as a hologram and addresses the trolls in a beautiful sort of broadcast troll song version of a speech. But they're not sure that they fully understand, but hopefully they get the idea and it will convince them that the humans are trying to change their ways and it's okay to come back. And then once he sort of goes, well, I guess I'm not needed here anymore. I'll just leave this thing to run. The beagles are like, oh, you've, you're done? You're done with that? And he's like, yeah. And they go, right run and it becomes <laughs> vimes versus the werewolves uh and he he's chased by snowy and she wants him to bring back his head as a trophy and this is because finn mccall hates him and has basically made this part of the deal and it's like look i'll go and get these ray guns and i'll help this happen but i hate this guy because of what he did to me to kill him like take his head do that for me i'll help make this deal happen uh, and it, again i don't know if that's explicitly in there but it seemed pretty clear to me that that was what was going on and that's why they had to set up that he wanted to betray him earlier on joshua does get caught but he's caught by snowy and then the healer beagle that they've met before lily or lily i wasn't quite sure how to <laughs> a say healer that. very good um, <laughs> <laughs> i didn't mean that one that was accidental uh <laughs> But she shows up as well, and uh, she's the one who stapled him in the first place, but she was kept saying sorry when she did it because she's a bit of a, you know, like a doctor. She doesn't want to hurt people. Uh, she's like, look, um, we, we're going to let you go, but to do that, we're going to have to help the story, which is like, okay, well, when we killed you, we fucked up your face, basically. <laughs> so the, the head is not a good trophy, but we still have to bring back a trophy or they won't believe us and we'll be in trouble. So... Uh, we're going to bite your hand off, which they do. And then it kind of cuts from there to later on. <laughs> nice barbecue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a party that Lobsang is throwing because all of his things have gone well. And they bring uh, Jansen back to Earth uh, 10, I think it is. And they say, you can stay here instead of on Earth 5. We'll look after you because you're really sick now. Uh, but come to this party that we're having in September because we get a couple of actual dates which was a bit weird because it seemed like you had to work it out yourself for quite a lot of the book and then they're like oh no it's the 16th of july 2040 and you're like oh, i did all this maths earlier why did i bother <laughs> um but yeah they have a big party where lobsang invites all the people from the book who all the he's... side plot except for like the asians <laughs> yeah they don't they don't get to come <laughs> well he's got no hold over them apparently although you'd think he would because he's they're based their airships on his technology as well but anyway uh, yeah, they're having this party and Jansen's like, oh, I'm feeling a bit sick. I think I'll go. Uh, and just as she's about to leave, everybody's phones go off, which is kind of what happened back in the first book, more or less, when everybody heard about the nuclear bomb uh, and they're all being told to step to escape. So it was kind of like, oh, no, it's happening again. But this time the news is that there's been a massive eruption and in Yellowstone National Park, where there's been this sort of geological upheaval, not just on the Datum Earth, but in all the low Earths nearby, on the Datum Earth, though, is where it's actually erupted. Massive eruption, huge amounts of ash in the air, lots of people presumably killed, although they don't really say that straight up, and millions of people fleeing as refugees into stepwise versions of America as ash covers the sky. And the last thing that happens is Jansen, who's reunited with one of the guys from uh, Gap Space, who was coming on to her, and she sort of explains to him, I'm not interested in men. What's that great line? It's something quite... like my rocket takes off from another port or oh, something. Oh, yeah, I wrote that <laughs> one. Down. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My rocket takes off from a different launch pad, yeah. <laughs> uh, which she says to Sally earlier on. But then when she says it to him, she just straight up says, look, you should know I'm gay. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay. Well, thanks for letting me know. Do you still want to go out for dinner sometime? And I'm like, that's kind of nice. Yeah, I liked that. Um, hmm. Yeah. But then, you know, she, she goes back to one of the low-earth Madisons to try and help with coordinate what's going on, but she can't really do anything. She's too sick. 
So she gets taken away to palliative care. And the last thing that happens is after she's been treated a bit more, they're looking at the news about how the eruption's getting worse and now it's starting to affect the rest of the world. And she slips into unconsciousness and can't hear the person who's talking to her. And that's, that's the end of the book. Mm. I mean, geez. And I look, I, I was really disappointed by this. So I love her. I know I've said this already, but she's one of my favorite characters from the first book. I love her in this book. I was really glad to see her get a bit more action, like she's out there doing stuff in this book, but she's she's sick, she's alone, and she dies. And there is a trope in fiction that gets referred to as the bury your gaze trope, mm. where the characters who have the tragic story and die are the ones who are not straight. And she is the only queer, well, the only queer character we hear about mm. in this whole book. And she's the one who sacrifices herself and is conveniently already terminally ill. And I was just, and then, and I, you know what? And I, because she got cool shit to do and I was like, all right, you've been on quite an adventure. Um, I'm, I can kind of go with this, but then she dies. And the person who is with her at the end is some random straight dude who was nice enough in inverted commas to be friends with her when he realized that she wouldn't be interested in him. And not Joshua, the person she's known the longest in mm. the book. Mm. You know, they have a touching reunion at the party. And I'm like, he should be there when she's dying. And I was really, I, I was actually quite surprised when I got to the end of the book. I was like, I, I knew she was going to die. Like, it was not subtle that that was going to happen. But then when she dies, kind of not alone, but with this other dude who we've met twice, I was I like, I can't even no. remember his name. <laughs> Frank something. I think yeah. he is in the first book, maybe briefly. But yeah, I was just really disappointed by that. I agree. And the the significance that was given to him being with her as well was a bit strange. Like, you know, I think he gets the last line of dialogue in the book, which is, you know, what will become of us? And then she's hmm. silent. And it was it was almost like a romantic ending for these non-romantic characters. It was it was this hmm. strangely signif- emotionally significant tragic moment for characters who just hadn't really had that dynamic set up and who didn't ha- really have that relationship. Um, and like you say, it, it had sort of bury your gay overtones that uh, are a bit uncomfortable because although it wasn't entirely playing into that trope, like as you say, she had a point in the story, she had some great moments and everything. Yeah. Like, you know, bury your gaze isn't about, you know, you're not allowed to ever kill off a queer character ever. It's about, you know, is, is the only character who dies a queer character, that kind of thing. And that's mm-hmm. where it starts to get a little bit iffy, I think. So, yeah, I, I agree that that was, I didn't really like that ending. No. And I think, look, I think that guy, Frank from Gap Space, uh, given that the next couple of books have spacey titles and Mm. are clearly about, you know, exploring the space of the long earth, I'm sure he will. Mm. Well, I would be very surprised if he doesn't come back and be a major part of that. But I don't want to trade spooky for him. Mm. You know, (laughs) I don't want this to be the end of her story. And I mean, if Lobsang brings her back, I will be a bit like, how? But also (laughs) I'll be like, okay, good. (laughs) Because that would be shit otherwise. And then maybe she and Agnes and Lobsang can go off and have, like, adventures as, you know, the three immortals who right the wrongs of the universe. That would be pretty um, or great. Or maybe Lobsang can get blown up and it's just Agnes and, and Spooky. <laughs> yeah. I'd be totally yeah. okay I'd love with that. that. Yeah. Um, OTP. But, <laughs> yeah. 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 They're my OTP. No, I don't. I th- I th- Agnes is a nun. I don't think she's going to go there. Although she is the nun who's trying to get the catholic church to embrace the idea of a female orgasm or female masturbation i think it yeah, was yeah so like, she's gonna go sure there it's gonna be Agnes. but also i'm just happy for them to have like queer platonic fun times across the universe you know that's good too that would also be great yeah but look that's the end of the main plot is it are there any bits of it that we want to go over before we kind of fairly quickly like explain what the other kind of plots were i mean i don't think we need to go into a lot of detail about the other ones no nah. It's such a long book. I tried to confirm whether this was Pratchett's longest book, and I think it is his second longest book. I think the only longer one is Unseen Academicals, which is about 40 pages longer than this in the same kind of paperback edition. So it's quite a bit longer. But yeah, it's a long book. There's a lot of stuff happening. Well, one quick thing we should probably mention is the war. Um- <laughs> oh, yeah, the war. <laughs> So this is this kind of the end of the, the I think culmination that that of the. That says it all, really. The fact that we had to put it in as an afterthought. Uh, we could talk about the main plot, and it doesn't even. Well, I mean, because this is part of the USS Benjamin Franklin plotline, right? Where Maggie Kaufman takes the airship 
And as as Sally <laughs> mentions, I love the way she describes it. Uh, you're on a galumphing Starfleet mission. And then she says, yeah, it really is like bloody Star Trek. And you're like, yeah, it is. Because they send <laughs> these ships out to visit all the colonies of the Long Earth and sort of just say, hey, we're here and we'll try and help you with your problems. So she has a whole bunch of cool adventures and they are pretty cool. Like there are a lot mm. of them are. It does feel like Star Trek. It's like, here's our episode of the week. You could make a cool TV show out of this, you know? Again, I read its own book. Like, it's a joy. Exactly. The mission parameters are pretty broad. It's just go out there and help people. But also they're meant to remind people that they belong to America, so to speak. And she meets up with Sally when there's an issue with some trolls being killed by some humans. And Sally gives her the lowdown and says, look, this is what happened. You seem like you're all right. I've heard about you you got to get on board with this trolls thing because they're really important. And I think you should take some on your ship. And she's like, that seems a bit weird. She goes, well, it's okay, though. I can give you this thing that'll help you talk to them. A troll call, which is this translator device. And that's where we were talking about earlier. Maggie has this sort of change of heart where she goes to talk to some troll experts. She brings some trolls on the ship. She eventually gets her own troll call and speaks to them and ends up like falling asleep listening to them. Uh, which is I thought was very cute that the like you know the hardcore captain of a naval <laughs> ship would do that and then has to sort of sheepishly talk to her crew the next morning. I loved um, that moment. That moment where she connected with the trolls was so good. Mm. It was great. They really sold it. Like I really loved this thread through the book. Mm. Um, but she also has a few encounters where she meets some of the other people who are on the same mission as her. Operation Prodigal Son, it's called which tells you a lot about what it is, where they're much more gung-ho. And um, there's one guy in particular, Cutler, who's like the sort of second in command of the Admiral in charge of the whole thing, who's very gung-ho. And it all culminates eventually in them going to Valhalla. And the idea is they're going to march through the streets of Valhalla, not peacefully. Force. Yeah, peacefully. It's, it's so nonsense. And they're going to hoist the American flag at the town hall of Valhalla to say, you're not going to get your independence. But there's this fantastic like peaceful protest where people are not there's nobody there when they turn up and then they all step in in front of the town hall to block the soldiers and just get in their way and they realize it's not going to happen and they have this discussion where they basically go maybe now there's you know no scarcity we don't need war anymore and then they say there's the actual line in the book like and then without the firing of a shot the long war ended. You're like, it didn't even begin. <laughs> There's no war. <laughs> and also there was already an American flag up there. And then the cut was like, but we should, you know, put another one up, you know, for the for symbolism of the thing. <laughs> yeah, and everyone's like, <laughs> no, buddy. <laughs> I mean, this because that's the line. It's like the end of chapter, I think it's 67. It just says that for better or worse, without a shot being fired, the long war was over. So like, how dare you? How dare you call a book the long war? And then how dare you declare it over? Like, this I, is have to, I have to wonder, and I mean, we're getting into the realm of authorial intention here, which is like its whole own thing. So, you know, we can only speculate, but I have to wonder how much that was deliberate because I mean, Baxter and Pratchett, I think are very smart writers who know what they're doing. And my initial instinct was, okay, that's anticlimactic. You've called this book, The Long War. The war hasn't really happened. It's all kind of ended before it began. But then when I was thinking about it afterwards, I was like, well, maybe like maybe that was the point. Like maybe they were deliberately writing that as anticlimactic to make a point, like to subvert that idea of you know the mm. big sci-fi cross-world war that you know seems like an inevitable next step for a story like this. And maybe they were deliberately making a point about how peaceful protest uh, is a solution, and things aren't going to be dramatic if you take that road or at least not dramatic in the sense that you're expecting. So I, I'm inclined to give them credit where it's due and say that they were doing something quite deliberate here. But the it is, I think it is a little bit one of those situations where the uh, high concept of it uh, was better than the actual execution. Like it wasn't particularly satisfying to read. It's not that I wanted like a big, heavy sci-fi war. It was just that it seemed like the story was going in that direction throughout the book. And I kept sort of waiting for it to happen. And then I basically, the only time it actually happened was that I was told it wasn't happening. <laughs> mm. I think that's a great way to look at it. And I also think like coming off of that is it added a sense of dread throughout because I kept being mm. like, is this the war? Mm. Is this going to be the thing? That also added an element that wouldn't be there if that wasn't the title. Because mm. otherwise it might just be like, what is the end game here? Mm. Yeah, I agree. I actually kind of loved it. And I think the thing that really sold it for me 
was the little discussion that Mac, Maggie's medical officer, who's another one of my favorite incidental characters in this book, because I love a good doctor in a Star Trek, you know, and he's <laughs> he like fills that role. Um, and while also being quite different to a lot of the doctors in actual Star Trek, right? So I really liked him. He has this line where he talks about, like I said, you know, now that they're in this post-scarcity society, which is very Star Trek-like as well, a lot of Star Trek analogies here, why would you need war anymore? And also he has this great line where he says, you know, war is fun. This is the great secret of the military is that we like war. It's it's a good time for us as soldiers and governments but now we don't need it anymore. It doesn't really work. We can't get away with it. And that's, I'm very heavily paraphrasing what he says there, but that's that's the essential message. And I was like, yeah. But also I, I was so hoping that we wouldn't get, because it's so clearly an allegory for, you know, the Boston Tea Party and the, the actual American War of Independence, you know, with the Declaration of Independence that the colonists make in the stepwise worlds, like, they can't have a war. Like, come on. Like, no, nobody's going to support that in America. Surely. Come on. And I, I really like the Admiral character who's like, I'd, I'd really rather a war end without anybody getting shot. That'd be great. Mm. And so, so yeah, I was sold on it. And I, I agree with you, Liz. I think, yeah, because they called it the Long War, every time there was any kind of hint of a conflict, you're like, oh, no, is this going <laughs> yeah. to be boring? It's shit starting. <laughs> Ooh. I lost track at one point of what the names of the various Twains were that were part mm. of uh, Operation Prodigal Son. And there's a little bit where Maggie gets a call that, you know, the USS Neil Armstrong has gone missing or it's gone down. I was like, and who the fuck are they? Yeah, I know. It was said so <laughs> significantly. And I was like, who? <laughs> well, I mean, they do tell you at the start is that it's actually not part of Operation Prodigal Son. It's been sent out to explore the far reaches of the long earth, even much further than Joshua went. But. I'd forgotten that. And I thought, oh, no, this is the start of a war. And then they don't talk about it again until right near the end when Maggie gets given the opportunity to command its next iteration ship, the Neil Armstrong 2, and her mission is to go off and do that exploration and also see if she can find out what happened to the original one. And one of the last things that happens for her is she goes, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I'm like, yeah. And I hope that's the next book because I want to read that. That's going to be cool. And then the next book um, opens, what did we say, 4,000 years later? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, everyone's dead. Better be about the return of the dinosaur people <laughs> if it's 4,000 years later. I think the other major threads, like a lot of them are not, we don't, we don't go too much Minor I think, threads. into Nelson as a Kiwi. He's a cool character. He's in the first book. He's like a paleontologist who discovers a lot about what the lineage of humans is like on the other worlds and comes up with the theory that the other humanoids are evolved from early humans who evolved the ability to step but he's not sure that that really answers the questions that he has and he becomes a, a priest for a while and then this book is where he gives that up and goes back to being a scientist and ends up working with Lobsang and does have this cool adventure where he meets this giant alien second person singular and meeting first person singular who's a much more dangerous and bigger version of the same kind of idea is sort of a big plot point at the end of the first book. But it's a very minor part of this book. Yeah, surprisingly. Like, so yeah, there's a lot that we could go into because it's a very detail-rich book. But Yeah. Yeah. But I think we've covered all the main bits. And if there's any other little bits that we want to talk about, now would be the time. Were there any, like, you know, favorite parts or, or little vignettes or scenes or characters that people want to bring up that they really liked? I thought Roberta was really interesting in that she was almost inverse to some of the other characters because I was saying before there were all these characters who seemed really significant in the start and then sort of went nowhere. She seemed like a background character and then she became kind of a secondary main character and seeing her at first through the perspective of these adults who kind of saw her as a bit cold and academic and strange and then getting inside her head and seeing that, you know, in a lot of ways she was quite cold and academic and strange but also that mm. she She's actually got this heart that just doesn't show itself in the ways that people expect it to show. I thought her journey was quite interesting and I've no idea if she's going to come back as a protagonist in a later book or not because, uh, you know, as we've said, the way this series is written, you can't always tell when someone's going to be important later or not. But she certainly felt like her story was sowing the seeds for something bigger and her viewpoint on the sort of 20 million Eastwood travels were some of my favourite parts in the book. I loved those perspectives. I loved that world building of glimpsing all these, especially the Joker worlds that they went through and sort of that intense moment when they were in that place where they were just watching, you know, the local wildlife and they saw this herd of kangaroos.
gorilla-like animals get attacked by this sort of Tyrannosaurus animal and then it was all over in a chapter. Mm. But just that glimpse of another world, I think, really captured that sense of something that the char- a lot of the characters in this book were almost immune to by this point, that sense of wonder at these new worlds. Because the thing about having these infinite worlds they're stepping through is, you know, going to a new world is no longer a thing. You step through five worlds to get breakfast these days. So uh, just that that glimpse of the wonder is actually, uh, I found that really quite poignant. That was the sort of thing that I love in these exploratory sci-fi stories, that new perspective on a new place. Yeah, I really love the payoff for that for her as well. Because when they're coming back, because the whole point of the mission is they're going to get to 20 million worlds to the east, Mm -hmm. which is further than anybody's gone in either direction, and then come back again. And when they turn around, she has that moment with the captain who hasn't really liked her because she doesn't like any of his jokes. And it turns out, you know, that's because she's so smart. She always sees the punchline coming. Mm. So they're not a surprise to her. She doesn't find them funny, which is why she likes slapstick. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting insight. I've never thought about that. But she has that kind of really upsetting scene where he like turns on her and basically is a jerk to her Mm. and she's crying. And it turns out that's because she's realizing they're going to go back through that world with the kangaroo creatures, which she worked out are all going to be wiped out by this massive mm. storm, this hypercane, I think she calls it. It's like a huge hurricane. And she's like, I can't stop thinking about that. Uh, I think there's a great line from Mr. Montecute, who's like her minder on this trip, where he realizes that, you know, he has those kind of thoughts when it's 3 a.m. and he can't work, you know, can't sleep like a lot of us do. But for her, it's always that mm. 3 a.m. moment. And that was like, great That's line. awful. Mm. And then there's that thing where she's, even though she seems quite cold and analytical, she's still a teenager and she's seen all this awful stuff and this weird stuff and it's too much for her. And there's that bit at the party at the end, because she's at Lobsang's party too, where Spooky like, looks her up and down and goes, I've seen this kind of I've seen too much and I'm too young look on other kids' faces and... I think you're something else again, mm. and I don't know what you're going to be when you grow up, but mm. I'm, I don't know if that's going to be okay. And I was like, she's got to come back. Yeah, she's I know, right? Because <laughs> I love her and I'm also scared. I think it's, yeah, I think, I think she could be great. I mean, she is great, but I think she could go on to be great. Mm. I agree. Mm. She feels like she's already a good character in and of herself, but she feels like the potential for an even more interesting character, particularly given her relationship with the exploration that's happening and her understanding of space as well as the different Earths. I wouldn't be surprised if she comes into kind of the space exploration of future books or I feel like she's got some kind of purpose. She's got to. She's got to. (laughs) Yeah. The next book, she's married to Nelson and is jealous of Maggie. No. <laughs> Don't no. say it. You'll bring it into being. <laughs> Wait, what if she goes on Maggie's exploratory? What if she oh, goes on the Franklin Neil Armstrong too? Neil, sorry, Neil Armstrong too, not Benjamin Franklin too. I can't <laughs> There's keep too track many American of the names. I'm not invested many. enough to differentiate them, but yeah. Let's talk about our favorite lines because I do have one from her. And it's unlike a lot of the favorite lines we have on Pratt Chat, this is not a funny one. I thought it was really kind of poignant when she's so upset. And Mr. Montague takes her to sit with the trolls and listen to their song. And the trolls kind of give them a bit of a hug and they all sort of cuddle up together. I was like, oh, and it reminded her of home because in Happy Landings, where they're from, they live side by side with the trolls. They're sitting there and I'll read the line. This is no consolation, Roberta murmured, hiding her face. Just mindless animal warmth. I know, Jacques said, but it's all we have. Try to sleep now. I don't know about you, that I felt like that many times through lockdown, particularly this last one that we've had in Melbourne where my cat would come and sit on me and I'm like, this is all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> that goes right down now, real fast, Ben. <laughs> uh, no, oh. well, I mean, look, you know, I also live with my partner, so I, I you know, obviously it's not all I have, but sometimes it's what's keeping me going in that moment. Yeah, I really identified with that and I felt for her and I was like, oh. Please come back in the next book, please. That line was like looking into the void. <laughs> like it was, <laughs> it, it was quite a real line. I was like, all right, let's let's t- pull this back a little bit. <laughs> There's too many good lines in here, but another one that I loved was also by Roberta, which is humanity. She once said in an answer in a philosophy exam taken when she was 11 years old was nothing but the thin residue left when you subtracted the baffled chimp. Oh yeah, that was so good. And that and got that, her picked that for I... netball. <laughs> <laughs> that idea comes back to later on where they're trying to figure out how the beagles work 
and they meet this beagle named Brian who sits with them and says, I like different things. That's not normal in our society, but I like novelty. I like getting to go to other worlds with people who can step. I like meeting people who come to visit us. Sometimes you've got to feed the wolf in your mind, but not always. And is it like that for you? Whatever your ancestor is, do you feel them in your soul somewhere? And again, I'm paraphrasing, but I thought that was really like a nice theme running through the book. There's not a lot of specific lines that I want to talk about. There were a couple of good jokes. There's one where Lob saying, after they've met second person singular, he's describing to Nelson the fact that he's like everywhere and he's made copies of himself. And there's even one copy like heading out of the solar system on a rocket somewhere. And he says, I'm in with the Oort cloud. And I'm like, is that a nerdy reference to the song I'm in with the in crowd? <laughs> and I'm like, I reckon it is because it's Pratchett. Uh, so I liked that. And I really liked all of the Star Trek references. Like They're quite explicit, but there's one where they're discussing whether or not they should have trolls on the Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and one of them says, oh, they put a Klingon on the bridge in Star Trek. And another one goes, yeah, not a Romulan, though. Never a Romulan. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, harsh, but yes. I also just want to put out there the way that Sally talks about men. It seemed a bit weird to me. I mean, it kind of, it gels with her character, but also she's just so dismissive of men specifically, like humans in general, but men specifically. When they meet the guy at the space place who's into spooky, she's like, yeah, just, you know, undo your top button. He'll like follow you around. He's no more perceptive than most men. And then when they meet the beagles and they're kind of a bit confronted by the fact that the men are all controlled by their sexual desire for the women in that culture, she's like, yeah. Yeah. I've figured them out. You just have to look at one man and you figure out all human men. So it's the same. And I'm like, okay, I get it. But I also don't quite know how this fits into the rest of your character. No, it doesn't make sense. It's like Sally's experience of life, would be like the experience of reading this book. She just gets like bite-sized bits of lots of people. And I don't think that's enough to get any great insight because everyone is so different and so spread out and has so many different contexts. It's different if you'd spend your whole life doing this on one earth. Mm. So I, yeah, I just picked up the concept from somewhere, but I don't think it's from experience or like lived experience at all. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, it does come back to bite her because she, as she admits, as we said earlier, she makes a mistake about how she thinks these creatures will react and it costs Joshua a lot of pain and his hand. Oh, we can't not Star mention. Star Wars into a new hand, yeah. <laughs> but, we, but we can't not mention what he does with the hand when he tells the story of when he realises they're going to bite his hand off, he, he, like, gives a finger so that that's what's going to be on the trophy cabinet. <laughs> I love that image. Like, the practical part of my brain was like, how would that work? Like, is it meant to be rigor mortis? Like, I'm, I, I doubt that it would actually still be in that shape. No. But also, I just no. love the symbolism. I'm, I'm just allowing it. Plausible suspension <laughs> of disbelief for the lols. <laughs> and also, it's the story that he's telling so maybe yeah. it's not true you know <laughs> yeah helen's clearly fed up of it already <laughs> yeah, you've got to get through the pain of having your hand bitten off somehow yeah. right <laughs> yeah and i do think that that was an interesting way of showing his relationship with lob saying the fact that he deliberately didn't want a, a black corporation hand he wanted to kind of go like old school mm. manual because him having his hand bitten off at the end felt a little bit like a pointless plot direction because it didn't really inform anything but i do wonder if it was meant to be making a point about how this was another opportunity for the Black Corporation and Lob Sang to control him and he went out of his way to avoid that. Like that was sort of his own resistance because one of the things that not exactly bothered me about Joshua through the book but that I thought was maybe a little bit plot convenient was that no matter how reluctant he was about the things he was being asked to do and how much he'd have to sort of take a few hours to think about it, he always just went along. You know, Sally turns up, mm. he goes along with her. Lob saying asks him to do something, he goes along. He's sort of passive for such a main character. Like, he does go with the flow quite a bit. That little moment at the end where we find out that he actually resisted something that they wanted to do for him and to him, that was actually kind of a, a small but defining character moment. Hmm. It's, mm. uh, they really set up that aspect of his character uh, going along with things, I mean, mm. in the first book. But I agree, it still makes him quite a passive main character, yeah. Two really quick things I want to mention before we get on to questions, because I know we've got some good ones. One was just, I really want the, the term Godzilla Bites to be a real thing <laughs> and to take off. <laughs> yes. Such a good name for massive amounts of data. I uh, really love that. And the other line that I really liked is when the crew of the Benjamin Franklin or part of them are sent down to explore the world that Reboot is on. 
and they suddenly realise that their drop pod of stuff that they're supposed to have has been accidentally <laughs> sent to another <laughs> world. Uh, and uh, they're like, oh, what are we going to do about this? Well, there's not much we can do. Like, we don't have any GPS because there's no satellites here and we can't contact anyone. And then someone's like, look, just step over to where the twain is gone and contact them and we'll figure it out. And the man who's ordered to do this says, I'm sorry, no can do. I left behind my stepper. And their commander, who's getting into real, like, you know, Sergeant Major mode, says, You did what? Okay, who the hell else is here in Earth 100,000 and shit without the most elementary and obvious piece of kit of all? A stepper to get him home again. And they all look at each other and none of them have brought one. (laughs) And there's a really good explanation of why. It's like, you don't need one. Like, you've got all the gear you need and the thing is coming back to get you. But also, yeah, you're stuck on a world like 100,000 steps into sideways universes from home and you have no way to get back there. And I'm like, fuck, that's... Yeah, I just Why really are none of them thing. paranoid? And there are two things that I really love about that scene as well. One is that the Major also doesn't have his stepper, so he's getting really judgy about everyone else not having it, and <laughs> yeah. then it turns out he hasn't <laughs> got one either, so they're all stranded. And two, at the end of that chapter someone's got like a portable Scrabble game and he's like, you brought Scrabble but you didn't bring your stepper? And the guy's like, I've got priorities. (laughs) Oh, that's also, that's right because that's also the bit where they meet Jack Green and when they say you know, take our money and and put us up, he says, I will not and he starts doing the sign Mm. that uh, Mary the Troll was doing and then later on when they have the peaceful protest, the only thing that they start saying to the soldiers when they ask to move out of the way is they go, I will not. And it becomes such a thing. I mean, they're appropriating it from the troll who did not tell them it was for their movement, but still it, it felt good. Hmm. Symbolically satisfying, you know. <laughs> exactly. All right, well, look, we should get into some questions. All of these questions from Discord. All right, the first one comes from Bell. So if you were going into the Long Earth to start or join a pioneer town like hell knows where... What, in addition to essentials like medication and glasses, would you most want to take with you from Datum Earth? Oh, that's a good question. Look, I feel like books and games, you know? I need some dice, at the very least. Like, I can Scrabble. improvise pretty well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you well. Scrabble and you step up. <laughs> I, could, yeah, I reckon you could, see, you could make Scrabble. Like, Scrabble's not that difficult. You just need a grid and some little things with... Because, like, Arthur Dent makes his own Scrabble set on prehistoric Earth, right? <laughs> I reckon I'd have a chance at that. I wouldn't be able to remember the distribution of letters or the points numbers, but I'd make up my own version. Whereas, yeah, I feel like if I want to play some games, I need need something. I need at least some dice because dice are hard to make, so they roll true. You also need someone to play the games with unless you're going for solitaire or something. Yeah, I wouldn't want to go by myself. (laughs) This question reminds me of the classic, what would you bring on a desert island if you could choose? And I never know how to answer this because I kind Mm. of... I, I, you know, I start going through all my treasured possessions and then I feel materialistic. So then I go philosophical and I'm like, oh, you know, I'd bring my dog and my loved ones. And it's like, well, do I want them stuck on a desert island with me? <laughs> because I don't want to, you know, drag them into it all. Um, but I don't know, to be honest. I feel like there's probably some obvious answer that I will realize as soon as we finish recording. But, you know, something really profound and meaningful. But um, I don't I don't know. A writing implement of some kind, perhaps. You know, a notebook and a good pen. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a certain amount of stuff that will be there. Mm. You know? Like they've yeah. found a way to, to take high technology stuff, a certain amount of it anyway, from one place to another. What about you, Liz? What would you take? Unless you've been there, silent, not answering the difficult question. <laughs> I mean, I would choose a limited amount of photographs of family and loved ones. Like, because that's very portable, but also something that can't be created somewhere else and also brings with you a sense of where you've come from for future generations, which I think is important. Um, oh, that's so profound. Now my answer <laughs> sounds stupid. Cut my answer yeah. out in the editing. <laughs> I've had longer time. I've had longer like time I'm to so think, shallow. though. Oh. There's not- Dice, I'm just thinking, I like, take some dice. What an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> can I change my answer to photos of loved ones, please? <laughs> we can all take photos of loved ones. Good, okay. good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and we're not talking about essentials, so like, I've got good shoes already. But yeah, I think, I think photographs and also like historical record things that are easily portable because I think if we don't learn from the lessons of the past, we'll just make the mistakes again, as they are already doing in this book. So... Mm. Yeah. Next two questions from Joel Mullen. So where did you think this book was heading as you were halfway through it is the first question. And then what size did you think was going to be in the war going into the book? Mm, good questions. 
I mean, well, my I... answer to the first question is I thought there was going to be a war. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> Um, so that was uh, that was me throughout yeah. most of the book. Well, yeah. The well, who did you? Well, I mean, I think this leads into the second because mm-hmm. I I also thought that might happen. But who did you think? Let, let's get to the second one then, because is that tr- did we all think that was going to happen? Mm. Mm-hmm. I I felt like yeah maybe, but because they were introduced right at the start, and because they were made out to be so much more antagonistic to humans than they kind of were, like it sort of turned out that the beagles and the kobolds just think humans are kind of shit. Like they mm-hmm. don't really want to wipe them off the face of the long earth. They're just like we don't really like you very much, or at least that's sort of how it seemed to end up. Whereas that first scene was like we will drive them back to the horrible dens mm-hmm. they come from. And that was what I thought the war was going to be. I thought it was going to be the beagles and the kobolds. And maybe some big alliance of all these non-human creatures ganging up against the humans. I mean, ganging up. There are probably fewer of them, but, like, banding together. Uh, so I think that's that was my answer. Is that's, I thought that might happen. And then it, probably by about the halfway mark, I'm just trying to remember where halfway, because it's long, like 69 chapters, nice. 501 <laughs> pages in paperback. I was thinking <laughs> it, but you Did said Did you it, say it? <laughs> Did you say it, Liz? Oh, no. Um, but about it's halfway... The law. <laughs> Someone has to. Okay. But it's so well, unthinkingly too. Through... Like, you won't even try. You're just automatically like, nice. <laughs> well, about halfway through is where they get to the gap and they're, they're about to free Mary the troll. So I was and like... And buy some pants. <laughs> I think I was kind of like, this is the... Yeah, they're going to buy some pants. But I think that was where I was kind of like, this could be where it all kicks off. Like, they free Mary the troll and that's the trigger point for the war. So I, I didn't know, but that's what I thought was going to happen. I thought it was going to be Datum US and Valhalla, but I thought that it was going to become over the trolls, and so the trolls would join in the side of, you know, the US Aegis, and perhaps the others, like, wouldn't join in or would, but I thought that was going to be, like, the, the key thing. Yeah, cool. I, I agree with both of you. I was kind of looking at all these different threads and I was sort of seeing potential wars in all of them. And I wasn't mm. really sure which one to like focus on. Like, as you say, at the beginning, it really seemed as though uh, there was going to be some kind of humans versus humanoids thing happening. Uh, and then that kind of petted out and it seemed to be more about the human politics of, you know, datum versus other worlds. But then there was also this exploratory colony thing going on. I was like, is it going to be between the different colonies? Are they going to find some totally new world? Like, you know, the you know this lost civilization of the rectangles and it's going to be some other society that we haven't even heard of yet. There was so much big scale, big picture stuff happening with all these different relationships across different worlds that I could see potential conflict in all of them. Um, and the trolls seemed to be at the heart of it. So I kind of thought that whatever was happening with the trolls was going to spark it. And once the mm. trolls started disappearing, it kind of felt like maybe that was that was heading towards something like the trolls were going to some place where they might be gathering but the trolls were fairly pacifist apart from exceptions like mary attacking that guy in self-defense essentially there wasn't really a sense that the trolls were leaving in order to like amass an army it was more like they were just going away because humans were kind of sucking (laughs) so Mm -hmm. um i guess my answer is that i thought all the wars were going to happen and (laughs) i couldn't really pick one (laughs) yeah You've reminded me, though, that I thought whatever war happened, even if it wasn't with the kobolds and the beagles, because of the way they were talking at the start and the things that were happening, I also thought at one point, maybe they're going to manipulate things Mm. behind the scenes to set up a war between like trolls and humans or get humans to fight amongst themselves. And that's how they're going to get rid of them. So I kind of thought that they might be, you know, pulling some strings to make something else happen, even if they weren't directly involved. This ties quite nicely in with a question from A. Edmonds. Do you think the title is a bit deceptive considering how the book plays out? I enjoyed the cozy travelogue, but I found I was expecting the story to take a turn into conflict and confrontation that mostly never occurred. So we've covered that quite a bit, I think, but I think it's a question worth asking and like putting straight out there. And I also, I'd like to say that I really like that phrasing of cozy travel log because that actually, Mm -hmm. that really sums up the vibe of the book that I was having trouble articulating when I was reading it. Like, you know, the fact that I kept expecting it to be this kind of high concept, hard sci-fi space exploration. And a lot of it felt more like kind of intimate snapshots of exploring different worlds almost on holiday. And yeah, it it, it did feel in some ways like a a diary of a traveler more than anything else, those glimpses. So I just really like that description of it as a cozy travel log, I think that sums it up. Yeah, I, I really like that term too because it brings to mind the cozy mystery, mm. uh, the genre where it's like, yeah, there's a horrible murder, but 
you know, nobody swears and everybody's <laughs> yeah. quite polite to each other as they figure out who did the horrible murder. <laughs> and and I think this is kind of like that for me. And the first book had that feel too. It was like, oh, this is so cool. We're seeing all these places. And I, I really love that this book kept that aspect of the first one. But I, as we kind of discussed, I liked that it didn't have a war. And I agree with both of you when you said maybe that's on purpose. Like, you know, we want to set up this expectation so it's hanging over you the whole time and then it doesn't happen and that's the point. And I'm like, yeah, I, I kind of love that actually. Mm. Um, next question comes from Sven. Since it is a bit steampunky, rail or airship steampunk, what is your favorite? Submarines. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it's not an I'm option. Big, well, look, for it. me, steampunk is Jules Verne. And in Jules Verne, you don't need to choose. Robo's <laughs> airship can go underwater and on the ground and in the air. So have them all. I don't want to pick between them. <laughs> Um, I think my answer to this question uh, reflects the fact that I contain multitudes uh, because I, in real life, I do not like flying. I love catching trains. In fantasy, I am an airship steampunker all the way. I love that sense of freedom and space that comes with those really well-written steampunk stories where someone's up in an airship and sort of the world falls away beneath them and they're heading off into the clouds like there's something about that that just taps into this sense of nostalgia for a you know a history that I'm not even part of like you know airships were gone long before I was born and yet I read a story where someone goes up in an airship and I'm just like yes <laughs> um so but I think maybe that's partly because I am nervous about flying flying in real life like it kind of it's a way of exploring something that I would not really enjoy in reality very much in fantasy all things are possible and you can explore these versions of reality that you don't necessarily want (laughs) that's a beautiful way to put it and I completely agree with you in this like basically I want to read about an airship rather than around because like I, I think it ruins the fantasy for me a bit if it's like all right they're on a Who's building the train tracks? Why is it so restricted? What's going on? What's the infrastructure like? Whereas, like, once you built your airship, you can go to places. You don't have to, like, have tracked out where. Like, so the exploratory element is, depending on what kind of railway, I mean, if it's a proper railway, like, you're not really exploring because there's been a track built there. So Yeah. I mean, yeah. Look, having said that, I do like the idea of cool steampunk happening on actual railways. I love the aesthetic as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because there's a, like a Weird West game called uh, Deadlands, like a, a role-playing game, which is about, you know, like the Wild West of America, but all supernatural stuff as well. And there was a like a war game based on it, which was different train companies shooting at each other on tracks, but they're like also doing Mad Max. And I'm like, that's kind of awesome. <laughs> like, how do you make that exciting when you can't steer? Like, uh <laughs> So I kind of see that as an interesting challenge and kind of awesome. And I do like trains, particularly steam trains. But yeah, I don't want to choose. I want my steampunk to have all the flavors. I love that, like the Agatha Christiness of a train mm. and like the sort of like the 1920s, like sort of trains, which are really cool. I also just have this mental image of like this really cool train that just like builds its own track, but like digs up the past one and like, like, but what's the point? I mean, like, you just like <laughs> just build floating. a giant wheel. You've been watching yeah, exactly. too much Snowpiercer, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> it would be amazing. Like, I just think like the idea of like it builds a few tracks in front of it while digging up the ones behind and it just keeps going on. Like, that's kind of. I feel pointless. sure I've cool. seen this in something. It feels like I a feel very like that's image, in there. Actually. I'm going to have to try and find that for the show notes, I think. But yeah, I, I just love it. I Like, it's so impractical and unnecessary, but I love it. All right, so final question. We're going to round out with another one from Belle. As this is a collaboration, which contemporary author or authors would you have loved to see Pratchett write with? Oh, that is that's a tough ooh, one. That is a tough I, one. I know who I want, but you go first. No, no, after you. I know who I want as well, so... <laughs> So not a contemporary in the sense that she's writing today, because sadly she passed away a few years ago, but she was a contemporary of Pratchett's. Diana Wynne Jones. Oh my god, that was my <laughs> I knew I knew as soon as you said it, Dion, I knew that was also Liz's answer. I mean distance five. That's yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, like yeah. Cause I'm just oh my god, like those two minds together were just what they would come up with. And I mean, you know, Diana Wynne Jones and Neil Gaiman, I don't think they ever collaborated on anything together, but they were good friends in real life and they you know, that you see a lot of similarities between their work. And, you know, Gaiman and uh, Pratchett had, you know, one of the best collaborations out there in Good Omens, arguably. And uh, I think as well it would be really interesting to see not only where their minds 
kind of complemented each other, but where they deviated because, you know, Diana Wynne Jones is, uh, you know, a children's, she's best known as a children's writer, but she also wrote some really amazing adult fiction. Pratchett's probably best known as an, you know, an adult fantasy writer, but he wrote some really interesting children's fiction. So they both have that interesting relationship with kind of those different audiences and those different writing styles. And also they're just these amazing pithy writers who can be so funny and fit so much into a few words. And yeah, I just, oh God, just, I would love to know what, even just, I'd love to just hear a conversation between those two let alone see a book they wrote together (laughs) i would be really surprised if they never met given that you know they had neil gaiman in common but also they would have i'm surely they would have been going to some of the same like conventions or literary events at some point uh and i think you know from our previous discussions on the podcast it seems like win jones is definitely some sort of influence on at least some of pratchett's stuff so yeah but that would be cool Mm. what a great answer yeah well i i mean i've got nothing to add it was just yeah (laughs) It seemed like the obvious choice to me because it's just, I would love to see it. I, I feel like I yelled so loud I broke my microphone. Now, um, but- <laughs> she and Pratchett, I think, would just have just yeah, great beautiful. minds. Yeah, <laughs> would have met. Dion, yeah. clearly we have to get you back when we do our spin off Diana Wynne Jones podcast. Oh my God, if you do, I, you will not be able to keep me away. I'll be outside your door just tapping on the window. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm very excited. It's going to be great. Uh, but I think. I think that's it. I think that's all of our questions. That leads us to the end of the episode. Dion, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. <laughs> what, what, a, what a pleasure to have you here. And I noticed that you've been checking and it looks like you are allowed to share something with us. So some news that I am very excited to plug is that RMIT is this year launching something called the Speculate Prize. Uh, This is something that Speculate is supporting. Um, We're a partner on it. And it's also uh, being presented in partnership with Giramondo Publishing and sponsored by Whisper. So uh, a lot of great organizations involved in this. And it's a really exciting new opportunity for speculative fiction writers with unpublished manuscripts between, I believe, 30,000 and 100,000 words words and it is open for submissions now and the winner will receive five thousand dollars prize money uh, as well as a mentorship from Giramondo Publishing and a week-long residency and there's also a place for a highly commended writer who will receive a 12-month book subscription and a feedback session with a Giramondo editor so it's a really fantastic opportunity and it's I think going to lead to some really exciting new stuff in in speculative fiction so um, I'm really pleased that something that's been in the works for a while we can now announce it and start encouraging people to look it up and uh, begin submitting. So yeah, submissions are open now until the 1st of September and um, we'd love to see people um, putting something in. That is really exciting. And just to clarify, it is a national prize, which probably means only Australians can enter and it is biennial. So if you haven't written a manuscript already, wait a couple of years, you can have another go. Uh, We'll put a link and details in the episode notes so you can find the Speculate Prize. Dion, thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, we would if if we ever do these other podcasts we keep talking about that we have no time to do while we're doing this one, we will definitely be asking you back to talk more about uh, Dinah Wynne Jones. Uh, I'm that keen. Would be a delight. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we'll make it happen. It's just when and how that's the question, right? I mean, if you want it to happen sooner, listener, you know what to do is to support us so we can afford to take more time out from our other jobs to make more podcasts for you. Or tell your friends, you know, help us out, which many of you have already done. So thank you so much to all of you who listen to Pratt Chat. You're the reason that we do this and the reason that it is fun every time. Uh, we'll also thank you to all of our subscribers, of course, who th- really did the heavy lifting on the questions for this episode, <laughs> which is fair enough. I want to acknowledge that a lot of you don't necessarily want to listen to the episodes that aren't Discworld books, but we are committed and we think every Terry Pratchett book is a joy and a rare gem, even the ones that are not good. Uh, which <laughs> there have not been many of. From my perspective, there's not been any, but I know there's been one or two that uh, Liz and our guests have been like, this was gross. Um, I don't think any of them are gross. <laughs> not gross, but like <laughs> not good. Not not his best. No, but that's okay. We're going to read them all anyway. But look, enough talk about hypothetical episodes, but we should talk about what's definitely happening, which is our next episode, Liz. Because we are, you'll be glad to know, going back to the Discworld, but not, you know, the regular Discworld. We're doing something a little weird, but something I'm very excited about. Something a little bit sciencey, maybe a little bit sciencey too, maybe sciencey Discworld too. The Globe, 
That was a great way to introduce that by that was, me. That was good. That was great. I loved it. Uh, but that's what we're going to talk about. It's true. We're going back to the Wizards of Unseen University and the Round World Experiment. And we're going to be joined by science comedian Alanta Colley, which is going to be great. And we're going to talk about, yes, the science of Discord 2, the globe. If you've got any questions about that, have a read and ask us those questions using the hashtag Pratchat47. And until next time, just like that, the long war is over. No! <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Pratchett, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast with Pratchett's Elizabeth Flux, Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest Dianne Sheldon Collins. Pratchett is produced and edited by me with music by David Ashton of Sample and Hold Studios. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pratchett Podcast and listen to past episodes and support the production of new ones via PratchettPodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchett46. Pratt Chat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrors. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.